Today, October 5th, 2021, it is 6.35 p.m. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Here. And Stephen Reblack. Here. And Mr. Ford will be joining us momentarily. Um, from the town, uh, Rick Ballarelli. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, Vincent Lee. Uh, ben, step away. You should be back in a couple of minutes. Okay. And Kelly Lindema. Here. Good evening. Good evening. Is there anyone else? from the town here specifically. Yes. Uh, Susan yes. Chapman, conservation, sorry. Okay. And Jennifer Rate will be joining shortly. Oh, perfect. And then appealing on behalf of Warren Place. Stephanie Kiefer is here. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good evening. And we have with um, us, oh, sorry. With you guys. Oh, go right ahead. Oh, I was gonna say with us this evening, we have uh, Gwen Noyes and Art Klipfell, uh, John Hessian, uh, Bob Angler, Derek Roach, and I believe, Scott Glassock is joining at some point. He may not be able to join at the very beginning. Is that right? I, I see him on, Stephanie. Oh, he is on. Oh, yes, he is. Okay. And Scott Glassock. Perfect. Thank you. And then a consultant, um, Paul Haverty is here. Good evening, Paul. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. And Marty Novers is here from Beta Group. Good evening. Good and evening, Bill Mr. McGrath Chair. Well. And Bill McGrath, Good. correct. Thank you. Good evening. I believe Aaron Ford should be on now. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meet. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access is listed on the agenda post town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. This chair reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. So we will start. Sorry, Mr. Agenda. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Hanlon. I am getting echo and am wondering if others are getting the same, uh, whether it's my connection.
connection or whether there's something wrong in general. But some of what, what you just said, Mr. Chairman, cut out for me. I'm fine here. I definitely I'm, I'm getting lost that your network bandwidth is low. This is video. Oh. That's unfortunate. That's what the echo is coming from. Okay. Um, do I need to repeat any of that or? I will continue along here, see how this goes. So item number two on our agenda is the approval of the decision for 14 Nicot Street. This is an administrative item. It relates to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted without input. Board will not take up any new business on the prior hearing, nor will there be any introduction of new information on matters previously brought before the board. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chairman, uh, the board has had before it for several days a draft decision. Uh, I've incorporated the comments that um, I've received and I'm ready to move that the board uh, approve the uh, decision draft decision that was distributed several hours ago um, uh, in the 14 NICOD case. Can I have a second from the board? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Okay, uh, so the motion to approve the decision for 14 Nicod Street as prepared by Mr. Hanlon. Um, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that is approved. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Hanlon, for preparing an excellent decision. Then turning to the next item, items three and four on our agenda, which is the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place. Um, <coughs> so turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place, at the prior hearing on September 9th, 2021, the applicant focused on presenting the complete project in its updated form with six duplex houses on Dorothy Road and a 124 unit senior independent living building behind. There were many questions and concerns raised during the hearing. At the conclusion, the board requested that the April 8 draft decision be revised to align with the current proposal so the board could discuss the proposed terms at this evening's hearing. At that same hearing, the board voted to extend the public hearing period to Friday, October 8, and to continue the hearing to this evening. At the time, the applicant indicated their reluctance to further extend the public hearing period beyond the 8th. The board has received revised comment on the draft decision from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, town departments, town committees and commissions, the public, and members of the board. Those have been posted to the website and to the agenda. We all acknowledge there have been several versions of the draft released over the past week and in the last several days. This has led to some confusion regarding what they each individually contain. In addition, we have comment letters from a variety of sources, and there are many items to be discussed and deliberated. The plan for tonight's hearing is to have a brief introduction to the revised draft from our comprehensive permit consultant, Paul Haverty. I've also asked him to lay out the criteria for closing the public hearing and explain what comes next if the board votes to close the public hearing. The board will then briefly review the findings to help highlight what information the board still needs in order to complete its findings. If there is additional information that is required to be submitted, the board requests that the responses be submitted in writing by Friday morning unless the public hearing period is extended beyond the 8th. We will then move ahead to a review of the waivers requested by the applicant. 
The board will seek to clarify any outstanding questions regarding what is being requested and discuss the proper disposition of the waivers with regards to addressing local needs. The board will then begin a prioritized review of the proposed conditions to discuss conditions that have not been aired during the hearing, discuss conditions requiring an agreement on the terms, sort out duplicate conditions, and review conditions requiring further action by the applicant. At that point, we will open the hearing for public comment. The board is very appreciative of the attention paid to these proceedings by the residents of this neighborhood and throughout town. Many of you have been at all 20 plus hearings on this application. We look forward to your constructive engagement on the draft decision. And uh, I apologize to all Red Sox fans that we are coincident with the game this evening. Um, and at the close of the public comment portion of tonight's hearing, the board will need to make a determination as to whether the board has all the information it needs in order to deliberate and render a decision in this matter. If the board is not prepared to close the hearing, it will need to negotiate with the applicant regarding an extension and a continuance. As was stated earlier, the public hearing period is set to expire this Friday. So now introduce Paul Haverty and ask him to give his brief presentation on the draft decision and the next steps for the public hearing. Paul. Thank you, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the board and I'm sure the public is aware, um, back in the spring, we had gone through a pretty extensive and comprehensive draft decision of the prior proposal um, that was in front of the board. Um, I wouldn't say that it was quite ready for issuance, but it was well along the way. It had um, many, many um, findings and conditions, um, and, and it was probably you know 90 percent of the way towards being a completed decision. Um, at which point the applicants um, came in with a different proposal um, that was you know, a rather significant change to what had been previously before the board, um, which has required a revision of the draft decision. And what I did is I requested that the applicant actually provide information <laughs> regarding the changes that have been proposed since the last draft was prepared um, and also requested that they oh. make any conditions or findings that either had to change as a result of the changes to the, the proposal or that they had a problem uh, with and would ultimately lead them to have to file an appeal if the, uh, the board issued the findings or conditions. So we've got that draft from the applicants. Um, there were a number of tracked changes left over from the prior draft. Um, there were also changes tracked by the applicant with this draft. I went through it in all of the changes that had been previously discussed um, with the prior draft that still remained relevant, I accepted. I also accepted changes from the applicant that I felt were um, not substantive and not necessary for the board to actually review during the course of its meeting just to try to pare down because it was a very, very busy document. It was difficult to follow along and it still is because there's still a lot of track changes um, in this document. Subsequent to that draft going out, we've gotten additional comments um, and suggested findings and conditions from town staff, uh, town departments and the board's peer review consultants. Um, and therefore those additional comments have made it into an additionally revised draft. So that's where we're at tonight. Obviously, all of this has occurred since the board's last meeting. This has been done without the actual direct input of the board members, um, because again, it's, that's something that has to occur during a, a duly noticed public hearing. So what's in front of the board tonight is not something that the board itself has directed or adopted in any way, shape or form. It is all really um, something to help the board in its process. But ultimately, any decisions with regards to any findings or any conditions are and waiver decisions are going to be made by the board at the end of the process. Um, so that's where we're at with this decision. As the board is aware, they are under a regulatory requirement in terms of how long it can keep a public hearing open. And we're obviously far, far past 
the end date of that period. However, we've received multiple extensions from the applicants, um, which is why you know we're able to continue with this hearing up to this date. If the applicant doesn't grant any further extensions, as the chair has noted, the, the board will have to close the public hearing by Friday. If the board doesn't close the public hearing at the end of the extended period provided by the applicant, the board is then subject to the applicant filing a notice with the Housing Appeals Committee of a constructive grant, um, which would essentially give the opportunity for the appli applicant to get the project approved without any conditions, without any of the protections that are contained in the board's findings. So it's very important you know, that the board comply with this regulatory process and close its public hearing um, at the appropriate time. Now, again, once the board closes the public hearing, the opportunity to receive any additional feedback from the applicants, from town staff, from your peer review consultants and from the public is over. Um, so to the extent that we reach the conclusion of the hearing tonight, and there is a need for additional testimony to, to be submitted, then the board can ask the applicants um, if it would be willing to grant any further extensions. And it'll be incumbent upon the applicant to make a determination whether it believes the board is correct that this additional information is necessary or whether it thinks all of the necessary materials have been submitted. And we'll just have to move from there. And that's pretty much it. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted me to cover, Mr. Chairman. No, oh, I think that's, that is pretty much it. Um, I think the only other thing is once hearing is closed, then there is a 40-day period for the board to discuss and deliver its decision. That's correct. And that time period can also be extended by agreement of the okay. well, applicant. Yes, please. Uh, I just have a question for Mr. Havity. Um, to, just to be clear on this, once, once the hearing is closed and we enter the period of deliberation, uh, the board can could ultimately reject the whole thing and say no, uh, or it could adopt one or another proposal on way, the way a condition ought to read, or it can write its own condition. Uh, it's not in any way bound by the things that we will talk about tonight. These are just, these are feeding into uh, the decision that the board will have to make uh, once it gets to that stage. Is that correct? That's correct. So on a comprehensive permit application, there are three decisions that a board can make. One is to just simply grant it without conditions. I literally have never seen that happen in 20 years of doing this stuff. The second is the board can grant to approve with conditions. And we have a draft decision that has you know, quite a number of suggested conditions. But again, those are suggested. It's up to the board to determine whether or not it believes that those conditions are sufficient, are too much, are not enough. And then finally, the board has the ability to simply deny the comprehensive permit. Now, the risk to the, to the board in a denial rather than an approval with conditions is that the applicant takes an appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. And if the Housing Appeals Committee determines that there are no issues of local concern that outweigh the regional need for affordable housing, then the Housing Appeals Committee will overturn the board's decision and grant a comprehensive permit to the applicant without any of the conditions that are currently proposed. So that's sort of the balance that the board needs to strike in making this decision. And my understanding is that if the board does deny, then the um, any member of the public who would have standing would no longer have the ability to uh, file an appeal. Is that correct? Correct. If the board denies the comprehensive permit, then there isn't any party that would have standing to intervene at the Housing Appeals Committee or to file a separate appeal. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're All right. So turning to the draft decision, um, the first section includes all the findings. I'm going to pull this up in a second. Uh, the board needs to determine if there are any findings that need additional evidence or support before the close of the public hearing. So let me go ahead. I will share um, this. So this version of the draft decision um, 
is one that came out, uh, I can't remember, if it's, I believe it was yesterday still, um, but it includes comments from the applicant from the town and um, I can't remember whom else, but this is the most recent version um, that we have. So the, just to quickly lay out the findings, there's the procedural history, which is really just sort of how we got here um, and a brief description of the property. Um, then the, the jurisdictional findings. Um, these are the, the findings that were required that sort of dictate how um, this is approved. Uh, it includes information about the this all the state filings and other such things. Um, this has one of the first blanks, um, and this is one I think we would uh, I reach out to uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development, um, which is what was the date of the subsidized housing inventory when the application was first filed. Uh, I believe that that's what this blank is asking for. And obviously that's something you're not gonna have on hand, but um, we would need that by Friday. And then we move into factual findings. Uh, this is again, these are descriptions of the, the property, uh, the challenges. We have a subsection on wetlands. Uh, more information about the flooding, the climate change vulnerability. And then this number 32, we're looking for um, areas. And I think that this may be one that uh, John Hessian, this may be more your, um, your area, if you're able to provide these approximate areas. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, if I may, John, actually, he has provided them. I don't know if he has them handy, but I have them handy if you, if you want those numbers. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, it would be uh, 25,310 square feet of temporary disturbance. Okay. Um, and then these, the second blank um, is 1,206 square feet of impervious walkway. Sorry. Or pervious 1,200. Six, two zero six. Uh, zero six. Zero six, yeah. Um, okay. And then going along um, together with 623 square feet of disturbance. Okay. Um, and I think it's, I, I think it's actually, um, if, if there's confusion, it's the outermost 20 feet of the aura. So I don't know if that makes a difference, but it just says outer, but the outermost, I guess. Um, and I think those are the okay. figures. Let me double check my notes, 25, 3, 10, 1, 2, 0, 6. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for those. Comment. On the transportation network. On this one here, my understanding is the current application does not include uh, blue bike stations. Is that correct? That is correct. 
Um, that was stated in, I believe, my memo to the board of 9321, and then likewise confirmed by VAI's um, email of, um, I think it was 10 1, okay. what, what the TDMs are. Um, and then these figures, I believe, were provided by Mr. Hessian on item number 59. It's 31.9% of the 5.66 acre development site that will consist of impervious surface. I believe those are his figures. Actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, these, those figures were, oh, can you hear me? Well, I can, yes. Oh, okay. Those figures were actually uh, provided by Bill McGrath from Beta, but we checked them and verified those to be accurate. I, I actually came up with 78,626 square feet, but uh, two square feet, we're not going to quibble. Mm. It could be a rounding. Absolutely. Okay, so before we get to the conditions, um, members of the board, in your review of, of the draft decision, were there any questions that you had on the findings that you'd like to raise at this time? Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, this relates back, I believe, since I'm like everyone working with multiple documents, um, but I think it's in paragraph eight is the first place it comes up. Uh, at some point, at various points in the document, the applicant has represented about the senior residential that the minimum age would be 62 uh, and that the, um, <clears throat> and the expected, uh, uh, and that what, well, the nature of the use is uh, independent senior living with services. Uh, and uh, we are relying on that uh, for a number of different things later on. And I wanted to be sure that if the applicant, if the board were to write that into the findings any, uh, and make explicit those expectations that the applicant continues to be ready to uh, uh, ready to stand behind them. Uh, to respond to your uh, inquiry, Mr. Hanlon, yes, the, the applicant stands by that the senior living with services would be age restricted um, 62 plus. And if the board were to uh, rely at some point, and it's especially, I think, in the transportation section to the expectation that the uh, residents of the senior housing are expected by the applicant at least to be uh, in their 70s and 80s. Would that uh, cause you any difficulty? I don't think it would cause difficulty. Um, and the the age 62 plus is, um, it's, it's kind of a, a magic number under fair housing because you can't discriminate um, against people based on familial status. So the exceptions are senior, Kind of senior housing, there's two categories, 55 plus and 62 plus under like fair housing law. So that's why um, we're falling under the 62 plus. Um, we anticipate the population to be older, but to comply with fair housing, we say 62 plus. Does that address your what you're getting at? Yes, um, it does. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, related to that question, um, if the applicant in the future wanted to try to convert the facility to- Sorry, Who is that? What's that? Yes, John. If the applicant wanted to convert the facility to a full assisted living facility in the future, 
what would that entail? And would that require uh, it to come back before us? I could ask that question of Mr. Haverty. I, I'm not sure what it would entail to convert from a, a 62 and over facility to an assisted living facility. I think the applicants would have to address that. But in terms of whether or not that would require them to come back to you, yes, that would be a change in the proposal. You would have to make a determination pursuant to 760 CMR 56.0511 that such change is a substantial change. And if it is substantial, you would have to hold a duly noticed public hearing on that proposed change. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I hate to be scattershot here, but uh, jumping way forward to what is currently number, I'm not sure what the current, the old number was 51. It's a sentence that says the project will connect to the Arlington Municipal Water and Sewer System. Uh, and I wanted, to, at some point, I thought that there was some question, at least in my mind, as to whether or not uh, the project would be linked to the uh, storm sewer system. Uh, I gather that the answer to that question is yes, but hardly any. But I wonder if uh, I wonder if that's correct, or if this should be specified sanitary sewer rather than storm sewer. I think that's a question for Mr. Hessian. Please. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, the project will need to connect to the town's municipal water supply and sanitary sewer system. Um, and the project proposes no connections to the town's municipal storm drain system. Thank you. Welcome. Anything further, Mr. Hanlon? I hope not. <laughs> I, I may have to come back, but it's everybody will appreciate how difficult it is to to go from thing to thing and and find specific things over so many pages. But I think these are the main things I had in mind. Is there anything further from members of the board on the findings? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. I, there were some uh, proposed findings from the applicant. Um, are we going to talk about those this evening? Should we do those now or not? Sure. On my draft, it's uh, number 16. It's the last one before the jurisdictional findings. OK. Um, and are we going to discuss, you know, have discussions about these at this time, Mr. Chairman, or not? Um, we certainly can. Um, if or, or if you want to just flag it and we'll pick it up again yeah. when we get into our deliberations. Yep, that's fine. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. If I could suggest it's going to be a long night. There are some kinds of things. I mean, I have some difficulties with this in terms of whether that in terms of the degree to which that corresponds with the judgment of the board, but that's all deliberation stuff. Mm -hmm. But where we actually think we need additional information, we need to bring it up tonight because we won't have another opportunity. Um, and so I hope that we we can sort of fo follow that that uh, that principle because if we have to, you know, if we have to really deal with the drafting issues now, uh, we won't be able to finish. Uh, I mean this. We may not have to adjourn tonight. We may just be able to last or last till Friday anyway. Uh, Mr. Chair, Steve Revelock. Revelock. Yes. Um, yeah. There are a number of 
elements in the decision that I would like to talk about, but I believe all of these could be addressed during the uh, deliberation phase. Okay. Mr. Chair, I do have at least one more. Yes, please. On um, my paragraph 52 within the transportation network, Yep. The finding talks about the reduction in traffic from the prior proposal. Can, can we have the information in here on what the increase in traffic is um, over current? And I think we had some, some discussion last meeting about the, the actual number of daily trips. I'm not sure if we actually settled on that number, and I didn't have time to go back and check them in the um, reports. It was 400 and something, because um, if we do have a number, and I, there has been discussion about a number, I, I, I would like to have that in here, uh, the actual number of daily and or weekly trips and the increase from the current um, project uh, not constructed. Okay. I believe, uh, just to confirm, no, but, uh, Ms. Keeper, both of those numbers should be transportation report, correct, from VAI? That, that's correct, yes. The, uh, the numbers would be within the VAI updated traffic report. Um, and then also, I believe, in um, Mr. Thornton's email of 10-1, uh, he had um, also provided context because there is a reference there to what the um, the traffic reviewers had suggested that it would be congregate care. And so he provided the numbers there that is the um, the daily trips associated with congregate care versus the daily trips under land use code 252 for senior adult housing. So both of that, that information is in there, is in that email. And then the, the number of daily trips based on the VAI's um, use of the 252 code is exactly within the report. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Kevin Mills. Mills. Uh, I have to say, I really can't offer an honest opinion on whether we, I require more information or not, because I'm looking at these several drafts and I'm having a very difficult time comprehending them. There's all kinds of editing schemes being used. There's cross outs, there's colors, there's background colors. I'm not sure what's being added, deleted. Somebody's recently added something to the existing document for approval. You know, I don't know what's in the backbone of, this, of the discussion or whether it's a suggestion. And there's several documents out there. And frankly, I can't sit there and uh, go through several hundred pages and try to find out what's consistent. So I really can't make a decision at this point whether we have enough information until I have a document that I can understand. And at least I understand what the editing marks are. I mean, there's comments on the sideline from various people, you know, saying we need more information or somebody's gonna supply information. I don't know if in another draft it's been supplied or not. I'm at a loss, to tell you the truth, sir. That's my opinion. I'm sure the public is of the same ilk. I'm, I'm certain you are not alone. I mean, I've written professionally for journals and stuff. You know, I understand technical writing and stuff, but everybody's got their own editing modes here. And I just, there's no consistency. And I simply can't understand whether it's being added or deleted. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, opening up to either the, the town or to the, the applicant, are there, is there any information that you feel is missing um, that's been omitted from the findings? Chairman Klein, yes, may I comment? This is Susan Chapnick, the chair of the Conservation Commission. Um, just one comment back um, to the board. Um, if, if you view the, um, the edited document in Word yourself, 
you can put it in a mode where yep. you can see on the side who added and who deleted what. I find that very helpful. So I'm just giving that out as a piece of information. Um, but the comment I wanted to make, at least from the Conservation Commission, is that I haven't reviewed all the findings since we just got a revision this morning. Um, therefore, I haven't had a chance to see if they are um, accurate, especially the changes that have been made by the applicant. I am frankly disturbed by some of the changes made where things were omitted. Um, and maybe you will address those in your deliberation of the ZBA, but I guess I'm asking what the process is for the Conservation Commission as an allied commission who is assisting you in this process, are we going to be assisting in um, rewording and uh, discussions in deliberation of the findings or not? Or do we have to put all our comments in prior to Friday? I, I guess I'm trying to find out what the process is, Chairman Klein. Mr. Chairman, should I address that? Yes, please. <clears throat> So uh, again, the, the board can't accept any comments from any party, whether it be town staff, um, other boards, the applicant, or the neighborhood once the public hearing has been closed. It's deliberation within the board only. So any comments that the Conservation Commission wishes to be made part of the record and to be um, considered during the deliberation have to be in before the hearing closes on Friday. Thank you. Welcome. So, uh, Chairman Klein, not to belabor the point, but um, considering you have a lot to get through tonight, I, I would propose that the Conservation Commission might be sending you additional comments on the findings um, so that we don't belabor it right now. Okay. Thank you. That would be appreciated. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Yes, Pat? please. Um, so I have a, I'm at a, <laughs> on at least some very, as, as the, the commission will know, the, the board will know, Mr. Rerick has uh, on more than one occasion submitted proposed findings of fact which I at least have, would like to make sure is in the opinion. And I think it's in some, some versions and not, and I can't find it in the one that we're working with uh, uh, tonight. Uh, these things relate to open space and the town's policies with respect to open space. And they logically connect to an important issue in the case, which has to do with uh, what will be done with the, uh, with the conservation parcel that, is not included in the actual uh, in the actual uh, project development, and I wondered if Mr. Haverty could uh, say whether the language that that Mr. Rerick has provided is is in this draft, and uh, if not, I will certainly at the appropriate time propose uh, inserting it in the draft, and and it, again, it naturally links up with the discussion of the uh, open space that is part of the application that we'll no doubt discuss later on. Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that that language is in this draft, but obviously it's material that has been submitted already to the board. So it's in the record and the board absolutely can review it and include it in any deliberations and any decision. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's in this draft, but I definitely have it in my, my, my own tracking draft that I have in the not, not the one on the screen, but the one I have myself. Chairman? Mr. Uh, Mr. Dupont? Yeah, um, this is getting back yes, please. to- please. Yeah, just getting back to what Ms. Chapnick said, I too, uh, along the lines that Mr. Mills has li uh, you know, stated, have had some difficulty in trying to line things up as I'm sure other people have. And 
I would find it most useful um, if Ms. Chapnick is going to submit some comments prior to the close of the meeting. I'd rather have those in the form of just a document from the Conservation Commission because it's going to be easier at this point rather than adding things in uh, to the draft itself. Well, then you have to sort of sort back through everything and decide what was there before and what's new, even though I know that there are those, you know, those uh, elements in the review that you can use in your Word documents to try to sort that out. But personally, I would rather see a document uh, just from conservation saying, here's what we think needs to be added. I don't know if that actually works for Ms. Chapnick, but that's how I'd rather do it. I'd rather have a piece of paper in my hand quite frankly, and then just sort of sort through and see where it needs to be added in. Mr. Yeah. Chair, um, may I respond? Please. Um, that would be fine. What, what I can do is if we have comments, I can put it in a comment letter and reference the section of the draft. Um, I assume tonight, since you're making some changes, that there will be another draft posted. If that's correct, I could do it on the new draft or would you like me to do it on the draft that you're working on tonight before um, you make changes? <laughs> I would use the numbering scheme on the this draft that's available online. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. There's nothing in what Mr. DuPont has suggested that is actually limited to the Conservation Commission. There may be others who have suggestions and proposed amendments. And at this point, it seems to me that Mr. DuPont is right, that, that integrating them into a markup of the existing text is just going to add to confusion, and they ought to be put in terms of proposed amendments to the document that we're working with. I'll take it. Um, unless there's anything further about information we need to conclude the findings, um, I want to go ahead and move on to the, the waivers, which is the final section. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, I just uh, I had a question on one of the findings to see if we should okay to discuss it or do it here. It's finding 64 uh, within the paragraph. Four. <clears throat> and it's the second sentence the board finds that such conditions will not render the project uneconomic. I mean, we've talked about this and that we, we apparently cannot get the pro forma at this point. I don't know how we make a finding that uh, the condition will not render the project uneconomic without that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so I just wanted to mention that here, I'm sure we will be, uh, I assume we'll be talking about this later on, whether we're going to include this finding or not, is that correct? And maybe Mr. Habit can address that, how we make such a finding without the pro forma. So Mr. Chairman, to the extent that we have received feedback from the applicant and they have not indicated that the conditions proposed by the board render the project uneconomic, that would support that particular finding. Um, the finding does go on to state that to the extent that it does render the project uneconomic, that these conditions and waiver decisions are supported by issues of local concern. Thank you. Is there anything further, Mr. Rourke? No, thank you. Decisions on the waiver. So this is still preliminary. Um, 
So these are the waivers that have been requested by the applicant and then in bold are the preliminary uh, determinations on actions. And the uh, board, um, just wanna make sure we understand exactly what is being requested by these conditions. And then are there conditions where we don't, at this point where we don't agree and we might need some additional um, input. The first two, um, I, think we, I believe the applicant has seen these that the, the recommended action um, is to deny them because they're essentially already allowed under what we are approving. Um, the third one is a limited allowance uh, to allow work within the aura as shown on the approved plan. If we had discussed the extend within the aura previously, those were figures that were provided by the applicant this evening. Um, then se the section 24, section 25, um, so these are the recommendations to grant them are from the applicant. Um, and I believe these are, uh, we will be seeing um, information from uh, Conservation Commission specifically in regards to these as well as others um, as to their recommendations. Um, the number six is a question about a bond. We do have um, some letters that were submitted um, in regards to uh, proposed bond amount and the board can uh, deliberate on that. Um, wetlands consultant fees. Um, so this is another one where we're, I think we're going to want to discuss it a little further um, where this specifically relates to fees that are um, as a part of any subsequent reviews. Um, and Mr. Havity, if I'm not confused is, do these fees relate specifically to uh, further reviews that have to happen in regards to the only the town bylaws or would this also impact um, any fees for, uh, for the uh, review of state bylaws? This is a waiver of a town bylaw provision. So it would only be applicable to fees charged under the local bylaws. But it, I mean, we'll get here is in reviewing the waiver request that the fee relates to submittals during the course of the hearing on the application. Right. Which again, you know, you didn't need separate authorization to in charge, you know, to, to charge the applicants Mm -hmm. for peer review consultant fees for review of the application and you have done so. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that this is a waiver that needs to be granted anyway. Okay. Uh, if I may, just for clarification purposes though, um, yes, Mr. Keeper. It, it was just under wetland consultant fees. So as like a separate one and, and obviously the, the ZBA went under uh, 53G for peer review fees. So I, I think it's, I know, Paul, it's a little bit slicing hairs, I guess, if you will, but I, I, I think that the, the issue is that the board got the services of peer review, you know, under, under 40B. So um, I, I think that it would be, it, that it should be granted because it wasn't, you know, the, the peer review is doing it, acting as the Z, on behalf of the ZBA as the kind of comprehensive permitting authority. So I mean, I'll, let, I'll let you, you know, advise your board, but that was yeah. just my take on it. Okay. Uh, Chairman Klein, may I, may I ask a question about that? Chapnick? This is Ms. Chapnick, yes. yes. Um, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I was under the impression that this also could be used for um, evaluation or review 
during the project. Is that not true, the wetland consultant fees? So for example, if we wanted to hire a consultant to, to tell us if the compensatory flood storage um, mitigation and um, uh, restoration was uh, being performed in accordance with the plans, that would not come under here? Mr. Haverty? I think that it could come under this provision. Um, I mean, right, which is, it which would is have why a better understanding of, of how your bylaw works than I would, but it, it right. certainly would act as an authority for to support conditions that are that are already in the decision that you know allow for consultant fees to be charged um, for review of submittal of final plans and for ongoing work and things of that nature. Right, which is why both Beta and the Conservation Commission recommending not granting this waiver um, in, in our previous letter. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, number eight was about the placement of dumpsters, which as we said is being denied because the dumpsters are interior to the building. Um, the stormwater mitigation one somehow got, got truncated here, um, but I believe that the request is to waive it because essentially they are operating entirely under the, the state and federal stormwater specifically under the town. Come back to that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. We just lost you for about two minutes. Oh, <laughs> that would explain a lot. Um, so number nine, uh, stormwater mitigation. Um, so somehow it came through in the draft without a description, but from what I recall, and I would ask, um, is keeper to confirm that this is it's a request to be waived written in a way to comply with the state and federal codes um and for that reason they're looking to waive the local code is that correct i guess mr hessian you may be able to answer that as well i'll do a first cut and then and then john can jump in if he likes but uh yeah so the provision deals with kind of stormwater management and permitting under Article 15, Section 1 through 5. Um, and there's procedures, application, um, calls for the engineering division's review and approval, um, potential relief from DPW. And we've asked exactly as you suggested that be waived, um, clarifying that the stormwater is going to be managed in accordance with DEP stormwater um, policy and technical guidance, um, unless you know the, the provisions don't apply to the specific project or, or parts of it. Um, and then the stormwater is also to be managed um, in accordance with a, uh, a stormwater construction permit from Massachusetts, from US EPA. Okay, you, Mr. Chairman. Is there requirements contained in sections one through five of article 15? Uh, my recollection, Paul, is that it's, it's more, it's, a, it's somewhat of a process waiver, if you will. And again, so if, if that's the case, then this would be one of those procedural waivers that would be denied as being unnecessary. If there are substantive waivers that are necessary from that, then we should identify them. Mr. Chairman, um, yes, please. Uh, just 
in addition to the things that Ms. Kiefer uh, referred to, um, I seem to recall seeing several paragraphs in here actually that there are commitments about stormwater mitigation, unless I'm mistaking what this is referring to, that are in the in this per, in this permit, uh, and that uh, those would be part of the the substantive things, if you will, that would. Uh, uh, that would, would, would govern stormwater, uh, would, would govern this. Now, I'm not quite sure whether or not it's exactly the same, and I wonder if someone could uh, clarify whether there's something referred to here under, under stormwater mitigation that wouldn't, for example, be included in this conditions of this comprehensive permit relating to stormwater management, which is a different word. To whom would you like to address that question. I would like to address it to anyone who knows the answer to it. Ms. Kiefer, you look pretty much. Is that pretty you? Well, I was going to say, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hamlin, I, I don't have the full language of the bylaw um, in front of me. Um, I, I will provide you a response. I just don't have the bylaw right in front of me. I'm trying to pull it up, OK? Thank you. I, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, John Hessian, I, I do have it open and, um, you know, the the applicability of the storm article 15 stormwater mitigation is um, development that it, impervious surfaces exceeds 500 square feet or alteration of the developed property by more than 350, 350 square feet. Um, it identifies the procedure uh, prior to the issuance of a building permit. The engineering division will review the application with the 14 days approve, uh, approve subject to conditions or reject the plan. Um, it doesn't specifically state it, but the in in reading this Article 15, it it, it appears that the intent is for uh, projects that come in under the site plan approval or special permit or comprehensive permit. Um, requirements of the town and that this project, Thorndike Place, has re received a, a complete and thorough stormwater management design um, review by, by both the town and by the town's peer review consultant data. Um, and, and to Mr. Haverty's question, it does appear to be, there's no real detailed performance standards or application requirements identified in Article 15. Okay. Thank you for that. And that's so it really is. A, there's a process wa a waiver from the process because we have essentially already completed the process. That's my lay person's interpretation. Okay. Non legal. We will confirm. I <laughs> that sounds correct. Um, number 10 of uh, tree protection and preservation. Requires the approval of the tree warden prior to commencement of site work. A uh, waiver from the procedural requirement of obtaining approval of the tree warden. The application does not request any substantive waivers of the requirements. Um, and again, this is a we've the statement that we've agreed to the substantive provision of the bylaws is, is then essentially a, a waiver of process. Um, and so it is being deemed unnecessary. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's fine. Just yeah. just to clarify for, um, I, I think that everyone understands this though, the, the bylaw provisions that would be applicable are those that were in effect at the time of the application filing. Um, uh, it's very, you know, it, a very it, good point. I'm sure it's, it says it within the decision otherwise, but just to um, reiterate that. Yeah. Um, that's a, um, Mr. Chairman, just going back to the article 15, says that that was adopted at in uh, 2007 annual town meeting. So that was adopted after, oh, no, I'm sorry, that was before. Yeah. And my dates all, could you, sorry about that. Oh, sorry. This feels like this has been going on since 2000. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it said 17 and then I read it again, it said seven. My apologies. Nope, not at all. Um, 
town fees and charges, the, uh, reduction in the fees, reduction of water connection fees, reduction in sewer fees. Those are all recommended denials. Uh, applicant requests a waiver of various unspecified definitions. That's being denied because it's not specific enough. Um, zoning bylaws uh, shall apply. Um, this is basically to allow the construction of the building. Um, so that would be granted. Uh, second is very, is similar. Um, uh, but this was institutes a special permit process, which we don't have to do because this is the special permit process. So that's the denied as unnecessary. Um, dimensional and density regulations. This is being denied because there's a more specific request um, under 18. Um, we need to confirm the floor area ratio information, make sure we have that correct. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that yep. it, it, it's not required. If you look at the, um, I think it's the, the materials and layout sheet of the, yep. uh, the plan set. Um, it's, it, it has the calculations both for the entire parcel as well as the smaller development parcel in there. Um, I think um, 0.6 something, okay. um, I, I refer you to that chart. All right. Um, so 19 uh, building in the floodplain requires a special permit. Again, it's a procedural matter, so that is unnecessary. Um, open space regulations. There's been a little question back and forth on this one. Um, now, the because they're supposed to be, so it's the 10% of usable open space, um, which is the issue. However, there's 12 acres immediately adjacent. I think which is what this is um, intended to say. So the board just needs to review this. This is um, one of the requirements. So without this requirement, um, the project can't move forward. So they have to review that. Um, next one is on signage. Um, we discussed this um, at a prior meeting. Um, essentially, I think we would be looking to um, uh, do a partial granting uh, to allow the signs um, that the applicant is asking for, but not to give a, a blanket approval for all signs. And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. um, just to clarify, right, we had asked for a, um, a waiver for the, for the number of signage. And there's under the sign bylaw that's effective for this project, there were some general requirements for signs like in any district and we're, we're not seeking a waiver from that. So the, the signage will, um, we're, we're not seeking to have those provisions waived, but this was um, kind of specific with signs within certain districts, I think business industrial or, or PUD. Um, and so for the number of signs. And I think, so I think you're looking for what the town calls a ground sign and a canopy sign uh, are the two signs that you're requesting. Those are the two main ones, and there would also be, though, as as one's approaching the property, um, signage that would be posted that would um, help direct um, individuals whether they're going towards the kind of the main entrance of the independent living building versus going down towards the garage area. So, you know, I guess the the question that we um, that that may um, be have some you know back and forth or tweaking is whether we can put both of those kind of directional sort of information on a mm -hmm. single posted sign or whether it makes sense to have separate signage maybe on, on separate sides of the, the drive or something to, to make certain that it's it's clear and plain. So, um, and and I, I don't know if those would be kind of wayfinding signs or directional well, I signs. I think that, I think as you had said before that those directional signs, yeah, that the direction. Yeah, so I think the directional and sight signs are um, are excluded from the 
the count and the requirements? They generally are. I think, um, and John, you can jump in um, if you if you know this more readily than I do, but I think the directional signs are limited to one square foot. So if we potentially had a sign directing people alternate things, it might be larger than that area. So that's why I, I left open the ability to have potentially more than two signs. Um, but, but you are absolutely correct that um, the, the, the intent is to have kind of the one monument sign at the entrance and then the canopy sign for the independent living and additional signage um, if, it, if it has to exceed that one square foot just to convey the information, it is more of a wayfinding, if you will, um, to just make certain that traffic flows on the site smoothly. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I, um, John Hessian, it, the zoning bylaw does limit um, Go ahead. traffic or directional signs um, to one square foot in area, which if you could picture like a typical no parking sign on the street or, you know, those are slightly larger than, those are probably 18 by 12. I don't know the exact dimension off the top of my head, but um, I think we would want signs that are, that are, you know, customary for the public you know, they're used to seeing signs like that, no parking, um, you know, and right turn, uh, typical um, typical size of uh, traffic management signage. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Yeah. Parking. Yes, please. Um, we're talking here about waivers, but but presumably there's some sort of a regime for uh, relating to signage that the applicant is proposing. And I guess the question I have is whether there, if we granted a waiver in connection with the signage in order to allow the things that the applicant is asking for, whether and to what extent those are specified in a condition or someplace, well, in a condition so that we can see exactly what it is that we're, that we're granting are, are all, are the signs on the plans? Uh, and if not, is there anything that needs to be said in order to nail down what Mr. Hessian and Ms. Kiefer has been telling us is what they want to do? So John, can you sure. um, briefly just describe where the, the signage is on, on, the, on the plans that are submitted? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, on the layout and materials plan, let me... Um, which is sheet C103 identifies all the locations of the, well, the, the, the two main signs that we're discussing are the uh, monument entry sign is shown on the right-hand side of the main entry drive off of Dorothy at the end of uh, Little John. And then the uh, canopy sign over the entrance, the main entrance to the senior living building. Those locations are both identified on that sheet C-103 layout and materials plan. That drawing also um, identifies the location of directional signage um, for access to the you know, main entrance to the garage, uh, directional signage that um, identifies the emergency vehicle access route, um, and then also no parking fire lane sign on the east side of the building. All of the proposed signs and their locations are um, depicted on that layout materials plan. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Number 20 to so 21 is the number of parking spaces and uh, that will be 
essentially set to the number of parking spaces that are in the proposal. Um, uh, the number of compact spaces. Um, the way the bylaw allows up to 20%, I believe there's 25, the applicant is saying there's 25% of the spaces are considered compact spaces. Um, that's something the board will need to review. Um, 23 uh, is procedural. Um, and so that will be waived to what's shown on the plans. Um, number 24, again, special permits. Um, so currently the, the town bylaw that was, that was in effect at the time is give a direction, a duration of a special permit of two years, the state gives three years. So we, um, the waiver would be superseded by the town bylaw, by the state law anyways. I believe that's the intention of the, the denial. Um, as being unnecessary. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I, if I may, I, I would suggest that um, because this is a comprehensive permit, the, the term of a comprehensive permit is set out in 40B, so that would somewhat override um, special permit. Exactly. So that's yeah. the, okay. so the three okay. years state law would supersede. And Mr. Chairman, this is not a special permit, so this right. section is not applicable anyways. Oh, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Uh, 25, similar, to, um, there are no variances because it's a comprehensive permit. Um, 26, um, uses within the floodplain district, after request a waiver of the special permit requirement. It's um, so the action is listed as a waiver, but I, if it's a, it's a waiver of a special permit requirement, then that it would not be granted. It would be denied as unnecessary because it would be procedural. Uh, uh, article 11, 11, 05, special permit, again, special permit that would get waived. Uh, not get, I'm sorry, not get waived, it'd be uh, denied as unnecessary. Uh, this special permit process for EDR, um, again, unnecessary because this is not EDR. Um, affordable housing requirements, section requires 15% of residential units be restricted. Um, the request is being waived because the subsidizing agency um, who is underwriting the application um, is the one who has jurisdiction on a comprehensive permit. So that's the reason for granting that. Um, and then uh, this last one here is a waiver for application doesn't, this is from the Zoning Board of Appeals comprehensive permit regulations. Um, and it's just that the application would be what the documents that the board has been provided. Um, and the request is to grant that. So the board needs to review that um, as a part of its decision. Are there any questions from the board or the town or the applicant on the waivers? Is there anything we felt we did not have that we needed? Mr. Chair? Yes, please. The, the comments we received from Beta um, this evening, um, I looked at them briefly. Uh, they look like they're in a different order from the order here, is that correct? Yeah, I noticed that as well. Okay. Do we know if everything in that beta memo is addressed here, or we can just take a look at that later? We can look at that again later. I had started to go through that before the meeting, but just ran out of time. And Mr. Chairman, will I take it Conservation Commission will also be providing commentary on these as well? I, I would certainly believe so, but I can ask Ms. Chapnick to confirm. Um, yes, we will. Thank you for asking. We actually had um, already made our recommendations about these yep. um, waivers in our seventh comment letter, mm -hmm. but we will reiterate um, the, the, the uh, applicable um, the applicable waivers and with the, the numbers as listed in this draft, 
so that it's clear with justification. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Anything further on this one? I believe that is everything on waivers. Um, so now we'll move uh, back up to conditions. Okay, so the, and what we had wanted to try to do here was just to see if there are any conditions that were, are requesting action, that the board is requesting action by the applicant that we have not discussed at any prior hearings? Or are there any conditions where there's disagreement? Um, and are there duplicate conditions? Because I am aware of a few of them that we want to try to make sure we clear out. And then uh, do we need to reconsider any of the conditions which require a review of information to be provided by the applicant after the closing of the public hearing? Um, so there are a number of those that are sort of that go through by a matter of course you know, the for the building permit, the application for um, any sort of state permits and things like that. But is there any additional information that we are requesting um, that there are any questions or concerns about? Um, so if there's anyone from the board who has specific questions, Mr. Revelack. Um, regarding, since it flew by on the screen, but the list of uh, drawings, um, I'm wondering if it would be appropriate to add at some point, um, it was an unnumbered sheet titled potential conservation parcel and dated 82721. Should that be referenced at some point? Sure, what was that titled again? So it was titled um, potential conservation parcel and dated 8-27-2021, but there was no sheet number. Mr. Chairman? Yep. Uh, I agree with Mr. Revelock that that should be included as one of the plan sheets. Um, it was it was submitted simultaneously with the plan set, but it was a, a kind of a separate sheet. Um, mm -hmm. And it should be added to this sec to the section on um, the site information, correct? Yes, it, I mean it doesn't it doesn't go to describing the, the project. So you know, I, I but I agree it should be make its way into um, into the decision. So if it's if it doesn't quite fit in with that one, um, reference it otherwise. But um, I was going to raise that that um, the board would probably want reference to that plan and that. Because we're we're talking about you know a, a twelve acre open space parcel and that's that's kind of your reference point for it. Right. Um, okay. And I know it is referenced in the, in some of the conditions that that sheet is specifically referenced. Okay. Okay. Is there anything else, Mr. Revelak? Uh, nothing that um, can't be hashed out during deliberations. Okay. There are any other questions or comments from members of the board on the conditions? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, we have a condition that uh, the applicant had a concern with relating to local preference. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say to no one's surprise, I assume that I will eventually propose that we adopt the language um, in essence that we did in the 1165R uh, decision uh, uh, rejecting the imposition of a local preference. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kiefer. Uh, just to kind of follow up on that, that, um, and I'm not quite certain how you did it with 1165, but it, correct, the, the request by the board for um, a local preference is just that, you know, the, the board 
can do it and they can do it up to 70%, but the board doesn't have to. So it doesn't, I don't, if the board doesn't want a local preference, I, I mean, they probably don't have to say anything. They can just be silent or they can say, we're not asserting. I'm, again, I'm not quite certain what you did with 1165, but um, it just, just so you're aware, I, I think that that had just been a carryover from the prior drafted decision. So, um, and Ms. Kiefer, Mr. Mr. Haverty has some elegant language on that. So. Oh, okay, super. Anything else that had come up in the conditions and people's review of the conditions that we should discuss at this time that may require um, additional input or additional research? You know, I had, there was a question that had come up on from uh, a member of the public about the question about the 100% survival rate um, of plants and whether that should remain 100% or whether that should be 95%. Um, does the Conservation Commission have a specific policy on that? Um, this is Susan Chapnick. Uh, we require 100% after each of the three years so that we require them to replant whatever died. But then at the, at the final um, application, we understand that you, you don't get all, all total survival. So um, we have recently been um, requiring 80% survival at the end of, of the process. So I don't know how you wanna re word that so like if you have a three-year monitoring after the first year if you lost 50 percent you have to put back 50 percent but at the end of the third year you're allowed to have 80 percent mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah so but the, basically at the end of each of the first three years you need to make sure that you are back to the 100 percent connect exactly. 100 percent Okay. Because whatever you said you were going to plant should be there again. I mean, if it died, then right. sometimes you plant a different species or whatever, you know, you have some kind of discussion about that with the experts who know what's mm -hmm. going to survive there, but yeah. All right, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Karras, do you have Revelock? Since it uh, flashed on, yeah, since it flashed on the screen um, right below the hundred percent survival rate, uh, and because it was a topic Bill? of, I'm sorry. Okay. Ah, no, go ahead. So there was also there's also a condition uh, only not only no non-native cultivars are to be used. Um, I know we had a discussion about this during the during in a different comprehensive permit, but. Um, I thought it would be worth asking if that requirement is uh, acceptable to the applicant and if the Conservation Commission uh, has any remarks uh, regarding that. We, um, Steve, if I may reply, this is Susan Chapnick. Um, we actually edited this section, um, beta myself and the applicant. Um, so the non-native cultivars were removed and the edits um, that just came this morning from beta are, are not included in here, unfortunately. Okay. So that was a good question. And we did remove that the non we left the native, we removed the non cultivar right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mr. Chairman, this is Stephanie Keeper. I, I was going to say that I think that this provision these this section here that's showing up on the screen. Um, yeah, there was some. Uh, well, there's two comments, I guess I have There's there's some um, changes that have been made based on the commission's feedback, but then also I think that kind of this language was repeated in two places in the decision. I think one maybe in factual findings and one within conditions. And I don't think that when Beta submitted its comments that I, I, I think it was going to remove that, but I don't think that it did. I don't know if um, Marty wants to comment on that, but you may find kind of similar language twice. And, the, the one place that I saw had the commission's edits um, and the other place I think was 
was either to be removed or, or to be kind of the two pieces kind of coalesced together. I, it's, uh, this is Marty Nova with the beta group. I'm looking at the version that I sent out this morning that Susan received a copy of John Hessian. And I'm looking for that section in, in section I is really what I concentrated on. And I don't even see that paragraph. So I'm wondering if it's in a different part of the. So this paragraph document. is in section C. It's in section C. Requirements, which it, it, it much more belongs somewhere else. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with see, what's yeah. being submitted per se. Right. And Marty, I think that was in I-23, if you're looking at your section I about yeah. the... Um, I-23. Yeah. Let's see. I-23. Yeah, the looking at does not have an I-23 for some reason. I'm going to have to look back at that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah. I wonder if we could, I mean, <clears throat> I know it... I wonder if we can sort of just understand that whatever it is, the, the, the language that the Conservation Commission and Beta had agreed on, uh, and mm -hmm. it should appear once. And so the, the place which isn't that language is probably something that will eliminate and we can work on finding mm -hmm. the right places during deliberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, agreed. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. I just like some clarification on this question about native and cultivar and non cultivar. What are we specify, specifying exactly? What is the Conservation Commission recommending? We're recommending um, native plants, and we do have lists on our website of native plants. We're taking out the word non cultivar because it's. Um, it, getting fine. difficult as a definition um, to understand that. And also there are some non-cultivars, some cultivars that are good for pollinators. So that's a judgment call. So we're leaving native. We're taking out non-cultivar. I myself would uh, side on putting non-cultivars in, although some are pollinators, for the most part, they are not and they're not beneficial to natural wildlife, birds, caterpillars, et cetera, according to what I've read. But we can discuss this during deliberations. Sure, and, and uh, another um, requirement the Conservation Commission has requested is a planting plan that should be submitted and approved, um, administer, you know, reviewed and approved, so, which we don't have, so as, as a, a condition. So hopefully that is still in this draft somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So there is a planting plan that was submitted um, in August, but it was only for the developed parcel, I believe. So uh, Susan, are you asking about a planting plan for the entire site or for just the developed site or just the conservation site? Um, so we had requested a planting plan for, for any of the revegetation that was within resource areas, including the compensatory re, uh, compensatory flood storage area, which is, yeah. um, you know, getting restored. And we did it, obviously didn't get it for the compensatory flood storage, as we all know, because that, that hasn't been... Um, developed yet that plan okay so the planting plan and that we have so far which is limited to the developed portion of the site um this is what you're requesting is in addition to that <clears throat> yes perfect So Mr. Chairman, anything else large and looming in the 
conditions that people wanted to discuss. Um, Mr. Chairman. Slide back to the top here. So the first section. Um, yes, please, Mr. Hanlon. Well, uh, the, this relates to Section F. I don't know whether it's large and significant, but we do need information on it. At our last hearing, it was suggested that the applicant uh, uh, at least consider putting into the senior housing a convenience store. And really, that is not just that isn't so much intended to boost the economy as it is to eliminate the need for for trips basically uh, by elder people who ha have a long way to walk to get incidentals. Um, I don't think that we're probably in a position to force the application to do anything or even to decide whether that any particular plan is a good idea. But I wonder if the applicant would have any objection to a condition uh, requiring them uh, to consider doing that as part of the conservation, uh, as part of the uh, traffic, uh, uh, the traffic control uh, sorts of things. We could kind of work out what language is. It wouldn't be very mandatory, but it, the underlying principle I thought was was a good one, and it isn't something that that it seems to me uh, uh, is ought to be very controversial. Basically, these seventy year olds probably shouldn't have to get to their car and go to CVS to or to get. Uh, uh, to get emodium or whatever they they uh, uh, it would be nice if if minor trips could be avoided by having some convenient uh, kind of retail in the in the uh, in the building itself. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, that's a it's a well taken point. Um, I, I think, however, though, that some of that is going to be dictated by the operator of the independent living facility um, in terms of how they see to break up the spaces. And um, the some of the introduction of that now, I would have to go back to look to see if we would then need to request an additional waiver because without the, we would be conducting a retail business as well within this. I mean, it, it would be incidental under a 40B, um, but it, it may impact kind of our, our waiver list. And, it may be something that, as I said, your point's very well taken, um, but that we would have to consider and with the operator and should they decide that yes, that they agree that there's there's room and it would be a very helpful thing um, that we would have to come back to ask the board if, if adding that would be deemed a, a change substantial or insubstantial. Yeah, I think that basically, if I could just add, I think that when you look at the PUD, that it, that this use would would be uh, uh, acceptable, but that's up to to you to take a look at. My main objective here is to get it listed somewhere so that it's on the checklist of something that people ought to consider, because otherwise, what we say at this hearing or any other will be lost in everybody's memory and and. Uh, uh, and this may or may not be thought of later on. So it would be nice to have it on people's on the checklist as people think about uh, what to do here. I appreciate that. And yes, I, I, the small scale retail is allowed under the under the PUD develop under the PUD thing. So it would not be a not be an issue. I'm just going to quickly just going down through the conditions real quick. Uh, so section A are just general things. Um, so it's the sheets, um, general stuff about the permit. Section B is about the affordability, um, the mass housing, um, the subsidy programs, number of affordable units. Um, questions about the, and then the, uh, the local preferences in there as well. Uh, the submission requirements. So this is um, stuff that needs to be filed um, with the town before, as a part of the final application, right. prior to the issuance of building permits, things that need to be submitted, um, and prior to the certificate of occupancy, there's additional uh, things as well. Um, constraints to the project design and construction, uh, which have 
mostly to do with operations and how things proceed. Um, section F is all everything about traffic and the traffic safety conditions and sidewalks. Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, please. I have a question about that. Um, and you'll have to forgive me, I, I'm going back and forth, but on what used to be at least F11, uh, let me make sure that it still is. Uh, there's a provision. Structure? Yeah, there's a the the applicant has agreed actually to chart to to uh, have a separate parking fee in order to discourage car ownership. Um, but there, but it did request eliminating a <laughs> paragraph that said the board shall review and administratively approve the parking fee structure, and any changes in the parking fee structure must be approved by the board prior to the fees becoming effective. Uh, that was part and parcel of what used to be in the TDM portion of this. Um, but that doesn't really seem to me to be overtaken by events. And I wonder what the reason is why it is that the applicant would would uh, uh, would object to that, considering that the underlying obligation is still is still there. So I think the way it's written now is that the parking so parking for senior residents, apartment units uh, shall be subject to an additional monthly fee separate from rent in order to discourage motor vehicle ownership in the project. That is remains in the document. And then the uh, the board approving a parking fee structure has been stricken. Right. It's that latter part, the board, the board approval and the continued review that that seems logically to still go along with with what once was F10. Um, and it's been stricken. The other things that are listed here seem to be relating to things that changed in the, from one thing, from one iteration of the plan to the other, but this one did not. If I could, Mr. Hamlin, maybe respond to kind of the applicant's thinking on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, um, Ms. Keeper. Thank you. Um, the, so when the board had proposed that before, um, the, the project was the 176 unit, um, multifamily project uh and and now we're looking at you know roughly 50 units less and, and senior housing um and so the i i think part of the 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 board's concern was with the larger multifamily project to kind of there were there are a few measures and they seem to be getting at the same thing but part of it was to definitely discourage the multifamily use residents to um, to bring cars to the property, um, and and then there are other requirements, you know, asking for kind of like looking at transportation demand and, and parking utilization and things of that nature were kind of the discussions at that time. Uh, with respect to the proposed um, 84 whatever parking that's within the um, parking garage, it, it's it's sort of much reduced scale, and I'm I'm not quite certain if like what exactly, what concern that addresses of the board um, and, and whether or not kind of there's, there's other kind of projects of this size that the board looks to see what a, what a parking fee structure is. And I'm not, I'm not quite certain what the concern is of the board. So, you know, why it should be a condition, like if, if, if there's a bit of context to that, perhaps we can react, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not certain what the thinking is with the 80 some parking spaces, why the board would like to review the fee structure on an annual year, on an annual basis. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, please. Um, I don't really actually want at this point to be an advocate or not. It's something that was in the previous draft and has been stricken here. Um, and I wonder if somebody from the planning department could could address whether or not what, what the underlying rationale, I mean, this isn't the board's request at this point, it's a suggestion made to us and I'd like to understand what the reason for it is. Lanima, I don't know if you can address. Yes, that. hi, sorry. Um, that was a recommendation from the uh, senior transportation planner, really what the planning, what the transportation recommendations usually involve is unbundling parking as a way of managing parking demand. Um, so by 
um, and I can follow up with Dan Amstutz on this, but uh, usually by, se by separating it out and providing a separate monthly fee, um, people sort of reconsider whether they actually need to have two cars or if um, only having a single car is sufficient. Um, so often when people are sort of recommending a reduction in parking requirements, um, that unbundling of parking is a recommendation as a way of managing demand for parking space. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Ms. Uh, it is true that the previous condition here would do that unbundling. So the addition, the only real question here has to do with the, the board review of the of the fee plan and its continued monitoring. But it's really more administrative than substance. The applicant, as I understand it, agrees that it will unbundle. That's correct. We can certainly discuss that further during deliberation. Mr. Chairman, I guess that it is true that Ms. Kiefer has pointed to a certain lack of information we have about the need for this administratively in the context of this program. So it is one of those things on which it would be nice to get additional information. I believe there was. Um, Ms. Kiefer did issue either an email or a memorandum recently sort of outlining which of the TDM uh, requirements that were from the prior version, uh, which are still in effect at this time. Is that correct, Ms. Kiefer? I, yes. If you look at my memo, I, again, I think it was September 3rd, um, I set forth the, the six TDMs that were being proposed under this project proposal. Um, and then again, on December, or pardon me, October 1, um, I had submitted to you um, uh, an email from uh, Scott Thornton from Vaness um, relative to, he had proposed um, an additional one that's, that, was, that was fine. And that was just, it was a carryover, the one he had said, and that was just to provide the information packages about um, to the incoming residents about the uh, area transit. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. And um, while you have this, you have this oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, while you have this page up, um, just, just to provide clarity um, on this F11, uh, I guess it is, um, looking back, there seems to be a disconnect between the um, the town traffic rules and what's actually the posted signage on Lake Street. Um, if you, I think you scroll, it was the, not that F11, the new numbered F11. Okay, oh, down below. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, and I. I right, right there. Okay. Um, just to provide context. So when I look at the town traffic rules that are posted online. Um, the, the rule provides that from Lake Street, one can't take right-hand turns onto Wilson, Little John, or Homestead between 4 and 7 p.m. Um, I think that the actual posted signage may be more restrictive than what the traffic rule is written as. And I think it's um, Article 6, Section 7 or that, that has that. So just, just to explain kind of the the difference between why is this right hand turn versus not one is looking at what the what the traffic rule and what the traffic rules how they're written and posted article six section seven which prevents only right hand turns um, and what's posted so however the board wants to address that just so the board's aware that there seems to be a conflict between the town's posting and the town um, posted rules one of the one of the local residents has provided us with um, with more information about what the specific requirements are that are posted today. So we have that. Okay. Uh, section G is on police, fire, and emergency medical. H was water, sewer, sewer, and utilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, if we may back up to Section G. 
Section G, yes. Under G2, um, I, I, I would suggest that perhaps it's dealing with stairwells and garages, um, how, how they're fire rated. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. would add a comma in there and say, or as required by state building code. And then, um, right, or, or, or something along the line of all, all residential structures shall meet building code requirements or something. Um, just because if the building code is changed, you want to make certain that you're um, requiring it to adhere to building code. Yep. And, and I know that we're now in section G. Um, and we may have some some comments on wording or suggestions on other ones, but um, if the board wants, we can submit those in writing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please, Mr. Mills. Backing up to G8 and the COD access, who initially suggested that and who struck it out? if I understand the editing correctly, involving the card access system. So, it looks um, like it was proposed by the applicant originally, who uh, has struck it out? So it was struck by the applicant. I'd um, like to know why, I can't. Ms. Kiefer? Sure. I, again, this this relates back to that the um, when we were talking previously about the the prior project proposal, there were going to be more users of the parking garage system, and so it was just because the parking garage is a smaller parking garage, um, a little bit more streamlined. Um, I mean, if 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 the board feels it's important for um, a card access system, um, I think that we can work with that, but. Um, I think that it was just kind of in line with the fact that we were going with a um, kind of a, a smaller project. And then also there's um, there's more of like a reception area when people are approaching, you know, when they're entering into the building. So that's kind of managed internally. Um, and the concern was before is kind of all kinds of users were coming in and out if it was just multifamily. Um, so I, you know, again, I, if the board has specific concerns about that, happy to um, address it. It, it. Yes, was, Mr. Chairman, further question on that. Will the garage door be secured or can anybody just simply drive or walk into the garage and therefore access the building without going through the front door? Ms. Kiefer, could you uh, reply to that? So, so the question is, can anyone go into the garage building and then, and then enter the building through the garage? Is that what you're asking, Mr. Mills? Yes, and then yes, and then simply get on an elevator and go where they want. Okay. Um, uh, Art, do you wanna, do you wanna address that one or or, um, Scott? Sorry, you may be muted. Simply concerned about the security I of our accept to, accept to, uh, uh, for for a moment, but um, there will be an access secure, and and I it, it could be a clicker, it could be uh, you're suggesting card, it could be voice voice um, uh, activated, but there will be security in order to get into the garage, and uh, I would say not limiting it to a card would be a good thing because they sometimes there are are um, uh, little clickers that or uh, card access that can be put on the car. There, there are various ways to do it. So the technology may shift and, and uh, uh, the only point that is salient is that there will be security to get into the garage. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, water store and utilities. Um, let's 
So one thing, so this came up um, actually today on a, or yesterday with the uh, memo um, that Mr. Hanlon had requested, which it was to sort of address um, questions about uh, local flooding and the impact of the project on local flooding. And one of the things that um, was noted by John Hessian was that the town um, currently has, the, the stormwater system has an easement through the property that drains four, drain, four um, and John, please feel free to correct me if I had this wrong. Uh, there's four storm drains in, the, in Dorothy Road out in front that drain uh, through a 12 inch pipe across the property um, and discharge downstream. And uh, he had some concern about the flow through the through that pipe and is it currently um, up to standards and had thought that that might be something the town would want to consider. Um, so I don't know how we address that. Um, is that just something that we, and this, this will probably be a question for, for Ms. Linema, if there's a if there's a note that comes across that deals not with necessarily with the applicant but deals with the town, um, do, what's a, the best way to pass that along? And specifically, it was mentioned by the applicant because you know this would be a time when that area would be open for work. Um, and it might be if, if the town was going to do something, this might be a convenient time to do it. And this is specifically and related to H nine. Sorry, I'm. Um... Reading um, here. I don't think it's specific to H9, but it's specific to the storm, the town's stormwater system and the easement that they have on the property. Mm -hmm. um, I would need to refer that to DBW to understand a little bit more about okay. the actual process of, of doing that. Um, sorry, I'm distracted by the um, cross out here. Um, so so that, was, you know, that was in the document that uh, that Mr. Hessian provided for uh, for Mr. Hanlon in regards to uh, local flooding. Okay, um, I mean the I do know that the town engineer has not had a chance to review that document from Mr. Hessian, so I would need to follow up with him and mm -hmm. perhaps receive some sort of comment letter to submit back to the board in advance of Friday. Would that be suitable? Absolutely. I'm, I'm assuming this is something that we probably can't, that would not be addressed in a, you know, in this document. Mm -hmm. um, but just as something that the town may want to keep in mind. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yep. Um, it, yeah, if, if you want john to kind of explain I think that you did state briefly or, or adequately um, what he had proposed that he can kind of clarify that. Um, and, and, and I also agree with your statement that this doesn't necessarily, it's not part of the 40B decision, but it, it, it is, um, a, a, you know, a central problem with the, the, the town's stormwater sewer. So, um, if they wanted to try to coordinate while the property is under construction, it would be, it would be a good time, you know, if that's something that they want to enter these discussions, I guess. Um, and then this, this H9, I wasn't quite certain what the like how this came to be, and so I had I had inserted the temporary question mark. I wasn't quite certain um, where this condition came from, and if if you happen to recall what that has to do with, um, it, it would be helpful to understand because I wasn't quite certain what they were asking for. Sorry, just one more one more note. Um, I just received a message um, just saying that um, easements cannot be granted by the ZBA. So as that pertains to this issue. Okay. That's easy. That would need to be referred to the board of survey. And I can provide the procedures for that. Um, I can give to a link. 
Yeah, I think we would, on this one, I think we would need to go back to the engineering division to see, I'm assuming that this would have come from them initially. And Mr. Chairman, um, if I could add one minor clarification to your summary of the um, storm drainage capacity issue, uh, the the oh, four yeah. catch basins on Dorothy Road and it, you know, the Dorothy Road um, Little John intersection is is really the low point in the neighborhood. There's additional catch basins. And that and storm drainage uh, moving up Little John towards Lake Street. That's also part of that system that's contributing to that uh, twelve-inch pipe that discharges across the Thorndike um, Place property. Okay. But the, the the low point at Dorothy and Little John is where um, you know people experience that that ponding in the street. Um, due to the, due to what appears to be some potential capacity issues in the town's system. Excellent. Thank you. Um, section I is all the wetlands, floodplains, environmental conditions. Um, it's fairly extensive. We do have some uh, recent notes from Beta Group, and we'll be getting um, additional commentary from the Conservation Commission as well. Um, this section. And section J is just other items. And then the final decision. I think we just need to, this just needs to be revised. Um, should be good. Okay. So anything else from the board, the town or the applicants in regards to the decision, things that they feel we need to address now in an open public forum before we move on. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Keep All right, thank you again. Um, I, I think that as you've gone through this, um, there's, there's, you know, without getting too much into the, the weeds right now, but there's some conditions within like section F that, um, and I, I think that if I'm reading the notes on the side, um, the applicant would, would largely concur, confer, con, concur with um, the beta's traffic kind of comments. Um, there were a number of conditions um, proposed to be removed dealing with the TDMs of the prior project. And we've kind of touched upon that before. Um, but again, I would just refer the board um, for reference points to that memo of, of September 3rd from, from me, as well as the email from Vaness on October 1 um, to kind of help as a guide for the board when it's going through these to see what the applicant has, has proposed as the TDM measures and, and to also confirm to the board that this is not a, um, a, a TOD, a transit oriented development. So some of those conditions were kind of written with that in mind. So just to uh, highlight that to the board. And then I, I think that um, it, as the conditions that have been presented to date, and I, I know that they may change, um, there may be some more technical or wordsmithing that the applicant would have um, comments to, and we can provide that just in a, in a written summary to the board. You know, a lot of it is just making certain that if there's conditions that talk about something to tie it into the approved plans, you know, as shown on or as consistent with the approved plans um, and, and other wordsmithing. But again, um, rather than kind of tie up your time. I think they're, they're more um, 
kind of, like I said, wordsmithing or, or just consistency with what's been presented. And, and so we can provide that in a summary fashion. Okay. Um, will there be another version of this? I know that um, you would there had been a prior discussion about comments that were just general comments or proposed conditions, um, which I think is a good one. But when we're responding to ones on a draft, would this, the merged markup, um, DPCD version be the one that you would recommend using? <clears throat> I mean, I think we'll need to to come back to that question at the end. Okay. Um, because it, you know, obviously, you know, we're we don't have a lot of time between now and Friday, and so if we, you know, we can discuss, and if we agree that it makes sense to extend that period so that we can revise the draft um, into a a more comprehensive format that's easier for people to evaluate and make it easier to make sure that we're not missing things, um, then that may be uh, something that we that we need to do um, if it's amenable. But we'll come back to that at the end. Um, I believe that was everything on our side on the comprehensive permit. So I would, I would, I would, I would like to open tonight's um, hearing for public comment on the revised draft decision. But first, I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, there's a lot of information to go through, um, and not all of it is simple. Um, and second, just a brief review of the guidelines for this portion of the hearing. Uh, public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. The board strongly encourages the introduction of new information. Um, as there is a strong record of comment on topics which have been discussed at prior hearings. Uh, to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting and to allow the inclusion of many voices, the chair asks individual public speakers to please limit their comments to five minutes. Um, the procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for prior hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comment tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You will be given time for your questions and comments. All questions to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us to generate accurate minutes. Once all public comments have been heard or the time allocated by the chair has ended, the public comment period will be closed for this session of the hearing. Um, we are doing very well on time. So um, I, don't, I would prefer not to put a, an end time on things. Um, I think we'll be okay. Uh, and the board and staff will do our best to show the section of the draft dis decision being discussed. So with that in mind, let me quickly put together a speaker list based on our raised hands. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, Mr. Urowitz. Can you hear me, folks? We can. Very good. My name is John Urowitz. I live uh, at the corner of Martin and Little John Street. Um, I, I, a brief little side note. I was up in Belmont uh, yesterday, cross route two from Wilson's Farm. There's a construction site there. There were 42 contractor staff vehicles parked on Winter Street and onto the Route 2 on-ramp. I hope that the board is going to offer some restrictions in parking for contractors during the, about the three years of construction at this site. That's just a little side note. Now I go into the nitty gritty of what I want to say. For decades, we've been fighting development on this, on this site for a variety of reasons. And for decades, we've been successful. Now we come along 
and the Zoning Board of Appeals is our last chance at killing this thing. It's an invasion, but we're hearing from members of the board that we have three options. The, the board has three options, build it as designed, build it with restrictions, or don't build it at all. If we go for door three, don't build it at all, the owner will simply appeal to the HAC. And from what I'm gathering is that's just a guaranteed approval by the state to build this thing. Does the town not have a leg to stand on against the state, our council, our lawyers, our officials, who most of them don't want this thing, and for sure the residents don't want this thing. I find that awfully monarchist that this decision is going to go whatever way the state wants it to go. And the town has got to get some leeway in this. I'm sorry. Uh, please, I, I, I implore the zoning board to stand up for the residents, stand up for the town, and shoot this thing down once and for all. We don't need it. We don't want it. And it's only going to tax all of our systems completely. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate what you do. Thank you, Mr. Gerwich. Mr. Moore? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, a question for you to uh, Mr. Hessian, I believe. The, um, the document that was delivered this week to do with uh, the water, stormwater mitigation uh, strategies and plans, that, uh, that document had uh, a lot of good information into it. I want to uh, applaud the delivery of that, I believe it was at uh, Mr. Hanlon's request, it's, it's good. Will that become part of the, um, oh, I don't know, binding official documentation? I, I don't know quite what to call it, but is what's discussed in there binding on the applicant? So everything that's in there um, is a part of the record and um, I'll refer it to Mr. Hessian, but I believe that everything that is um, outlined in there is in their documentation. Mr. Hessian? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, that, that summary uh, memorandum that I prepared at the request of Mr. Hanlon is, is essentially a reflection of all the information that is included, the design information um, that's included in the, the, what in the decisioners called the approved plans, which is the most recent set of uh, um, civil engineering plans and stormwater report. So it is part of the, the permanent record for the project. Great, well, that, that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that's good news um, because it does take into account the uh, climate change issues and the, uh, the updated storm, uh, the water prediction rates of the, the, the NOAA satellite. So, so I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, one, one additional point, and this really is just to uh, reiterate, uh, Mr. Chairman, what I believe you brought up, which was the fact that um, there is a stormwater uh, mitigation plan, but it's an easement and has to do with the drainage being not great in part of the uh, abutting community. Um, and I would strongly suggest the town uh, take advantage of the access to the site, the construction being done, and remediate permanently the long-term flooding problem that has to do not at all with this development, but everything to do with the design of the uh, abutting site and the, um, the stormwater system. Take advantage to fix that now, uh, because this, this needs to be done and uh, the, the residents of the neighborhood deserve it. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Britt Coogan? Yes, hi. Um, I live on Edith Street and I am curious. We've had a couple of sewer people come out to check our drain and it turns out that all the houses in our area um, have what's called a combined system. So a combined system is sewer and storm drain instead of having two individual uh, systems coming from our houses going into the town. 
So from what I understand and hear um, that oak tree will be going into the town's sewer system, but will not be going into the town's storm system. But we really don't have two separate systems in East Arlington. We have what's called a combined system. So I'm wondering if you will address that because if the town has agreed to allow them to use the sewer system, that is the exact same as agreeing to use the town and storm and sewer system combined. Um, currently pipes are four inches with new development, our pipes going to be six inches going into four inches, which is what we all have down our end. Um, is that going to create more flooding for us? So I would like if someone like could um, address that for me, please. Um, if I could ask uh, Mr. Hessian to just speak briefly about the the sewer connections um, and what size the, the sewer main is out um, on Dorothy Road that you're connecting into. And the combined, it's a combined system that we have. We don't have a separate system. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be my next question. Mr. Hessian, are you on? Yes, I am. I'm just pulling up oh. a plan, Mr. Sorry. Chairman. Um, well, I'll, I'll start by addressing, um, I, I can't speak specifically to the, the town's sewer system infrastructure on the Edith Street side of the neighborhood. Um, there are two uh, sewer lines along the, our Dorothy Road frontage, uh, one that's actually within the easement that we were discussing, um, you know, potentially asking for a widening on that. And there's any, an, a second sewer line uh, in the paved area of Dorothy Road. Uh, DPW has requested that we connect to the sewer line that's within Dorothy Road and, and not the one that's actually in the easement on our property. Um, I believe that is part of the town's um, combined sewer separation project that we we are connecting to at the at DPW's request. They're asking that we connect to the dedicated sanitary sewer system to essentially help mitigate um, or, or not exacerbate any problems with the uh, combined sewer. And, and the town, I, I believe, is in a Combined, combined sewer um, what is it, elimination project that separate combined sewer separation project in the midst of that. Um, and I, you know, under pressure, I'm not finding the, uh, the, the size of the sewer. I believe the sewer in Dorothy that we're connecting to is a 12 inch. Um, sanitary sewer, but it is a dedicated sanitary sewer line. But that is not on all of the streets. You're talking about just one street, which is Dorothy, but all of that will have to flow into another street. It has to go through whatever number of streets. Um, like maybe someone else can, can explain it. I see that you're shaking your head, Steve, like maybe like you know more, which if you could, that would be good. Because you're on mute. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am not an expert in this and should not comment, but thank you for your uh, confidence. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a question we'll absolutely have to address to uh, Public Works. I know we have um, a couple people here um, from planning, but I, I, I think this is more a question for DPW. Um, I do not know which way the which way these sewer lines flow. Um, they certainly should not be getting smaller in the direction of flow. Um, I'm a little surprised. That I didn't realize the town still had CSOs um, 
or at least the combined sewers in parts of town. Um, I'm glad to hear that they're being eliminated, but I will absolutely follow up um, with the DPW in this regard, uh, just to con just to confirm that um, you know which which way the flows are going and who is um, which way things are collecting. Yeah. Were there any other questions you had? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Matthew McKinnon, I believe. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, Matthew McKinnon, 9 Little John Street. Please go ahead. So yeah, flooding is a concern. Um, it's amazing when a heavy rain hits and we get a deluge of water that flows down Little John Street. It'll, it'll pretty much uh, be a raging river right into the entryway there. So um, I, I'd be interested in, in knowing how they'll deal with that influx of water. Um, but what I'd really like to talk about tonight is traffic concerns. Um, Chairman Klein, I believe you and other ZBA members have taken a look at the neighborhood and you may have seen a pickleball game being played at the end of Little John Street. Um, the neighborhood traffic here is negligible. It's, it's, it's extremely light. Uh, so when you talk about putting an extra 400 trips and these are, you know, round trips, right? These are not one-way trips. So that would be 800 additional one-way trips uh, on top of maybe a handful of trips in this neighborhood that we get daily. Uh, that's a more than a significant increase. That's a egregious increase of traffic. Um, I think that needs to be seriously considered, especially since there was no traffic counting done inside of this neighborhood. Um, you know, we have Lake Street traffic. Uh, we all know that Lake Street traffic likes to back up during uh, rush hour. Uh, when it backs up, it's uh, also around the time that the uh, uh, Hardy school uh, children cross a number of roads uh, on Lake Street to get the Hardy. Uh, that would be Wilson Ave, Little John Street, uh, Homestead Road, and Burt Street. Um, Lake Street backs up. Uh, in the mornings uh, going towards Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, being an avid biker, I know that I'm most at danger when I'm biking along the curb and cars are taking a left uh, into a street when there's backed up traffic because the, the sight, the visibility uh, when you're taking that left-hand turn is, um, it's, it's difficult uh, even for an experienced driver. And when you combine that with uh, you know, maybe rushing to get to this uh, complex, or if you have somebody that's hawking behind you because you're taking a left uh, during rush hour and somebody's trying to get the route two, uh, you, you know, you get some crazy drivers around here. Um, getting out to route two, uh, I'm sorry, getting out to, you know, Lake Street to go to route two, taking that left from Little John Street, which I live on, uh, it can take minutes some days. So if we have, uh, people exiting this um, complex and Lake Street is backed up and then Little John Street backs up and then we start getting backups throughout the community. Um, I think, you know, doing traffic counts here and really thinking about, you know, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of structure you want to put here. Uh, does it really make sense to put a business uh, into a residential neighborhood where children play. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something I think about all the time. And, and now that this is coming towards a close, it's, it's really affected uh, a lot of people in this neighborhood. And it's really scared a lot of us. Um, so I think that uh, all consideration should be taken place uh, about what kind of traffic we're really talking about here. And if these small neighborhood roads can, can deal with it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, if I could ask, um, uh, I believe Scott from Van Ness, the 
applicants, traffic engineers on. Um, the question about the, the 400 trips is, is that 400 trips combined entering and exiting or is that 400 each way? It's combined entering and exiting. Okay, so it's essentially 200 round trips. Correct. Okay. And did you conduct um, traffic counts within the neighborhood or just at the edge of the neighborhood? Uh, just at the edge, edge of the neighborhood um, as agreed upon with the peer reviewer of the town. Yeah. And what, what is sort of the magnitude of those counts? Um, at, at what location? Um, say like Little John and you know, sort of the, the those regular streets. Right. So find the existing thing here. Hold on. So in the weekly morning, um, exiting Little John, you have 30 vehicles and entering you have 19. Um, and that's for the peak hour. Um, yep. In the evening peak hour, you have 20 exiting and 14 entering. Okay. Um, is there another street you want? Um, maybe Margaret. All right. Uh, Margaret, you have uh, 31 exiting in the morning and 31 entering. Um, in the evening, you have uh, 33 exiting and 45 entering. Based on those and the expected additional number of trips, um, we would be expecting, what would you imagine? Like, are we, is it another yeah. 15 to 20 per hour? Is that the? Yeah, so let me pull up the table here. So we're looking at 412 uh, daily trips um, 23 in the, in the morning peak hour and 28 in the evening peak hour. Um, so then you'd expect the rest of the hours to be slightly less, you know, less than the 23 and 28, you know, just, yeah. you know, in a, in a pretty even distribution throughout the day. So the 23 and the 28, are those individual trips or are those? It's total, trips? it's total entering and exiting. So those, those are entering. right. Okay. So like when we were the number you were giving for like little john where it was in the morning it was 30 entering and 19 so that is 49 and you're saying this would be like an additional 23 distributed along all the streets yeah i mean yes exactly distributing okay. however however they choose to get out okay And again, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I, I think that these are just, um, you know, they're the based on like the projections, but it doesn't take into account, um, as we've talked about before, the the uh, kind of the measures that the applicant has proposed that that further reduce it. Like we can control in terms of the staffing and um, the peak hour trips and, and when deliveries come. So there's the, those internal controls that um, the applicant has committed to. And so it, for peak hours um, to kind of, for traffic generation, it's, it's more kind of spread throughout and, and taking off of kind of the peak hours. Um, and then just, a, just another comment or clarification, I guess, is that um, the independent living is, is a rental. Um, and I guess in, in one sense, all, all rentals, since they're not individually owned, they're not condos, they're rentals, but um, it's, it's not really a business use that the applicants propose. So just for a clarification there, it's a, uh, it's, it's home to these individuals, these, these seniors. So it, it's a, it's a residential use. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. McKinnon, did you have anything further? I do. I was curious of how they would control uh, deliveries. Uh, for example, Amazon delivery trucks, food delivery services that are ordered by the, uh, the residents, uh, you know, when you, if you are discouraging uh, cars uh, in your parking garage by, you know, by charging a fee, um, there, there aren't a lot of ways around here to get your groceries, for example, you kind of need a car or some sort of bike with a basket. Um, and given that this is a over 62 community, um, they might have a car, they might have two cars uh, to get, you know, because that's a great way to get groceries. And if you don't have cars, then you need to get that groceries, those groceries delivered to you. Um, I, I didn't know you could schedule Amazon deliveries, for example. Uh, I was wondering how, to, how does that work? Kiefer? Uh, sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the deliveries that can be controlled are kind of the, the food vendors that are coming to the property or, or delivering those. those. Those can be controlled. Um, the Amazon deliveries may be a bit more difficult. Um, however, the, in response to kind of the, the other part of that in terms of groceries, um, we have proposed, as, as we've mentioned previously, there's a jitney service, and I think that you know a, a part of that could be to have um, they do it in my neighborhood. They have grocery runs, and so there's a scheduled time that they go to a you know a grocery store, a couple grocery stores um, in my area, and then I live right next to a, a senior housing, um, and then they give them like an hour or so to do their groceries, and then they bring them back. So it it kind of puts multiple trips and you know multiple residence trips in one trip, if you will. Um, so I, I don't know if that provides further context. Um, yeah, a perfect world it does, but you know, we can't control all deliveries to the site. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'd also um, like to make one last point, if I may, Chairman oh, Klein. Yep. Yep. Um, some of the traffic counts you see coming into uh, the community, um, when Lake Street backs up, uh, cars like to take Wilson Ave and or Little John Street uh, and go up Mary Street to then reconnect back up onto Burt Street to then take a right and skip traffic for those couple blocks. Um, that causes a lot of traffic on Mary Street that parallels Lake Street. I just want to make sure that gets entered on the record as well. Thank you. We'll take note of that. Okay, next on my list, um, Jennifer Watson. Hi, I'm Jennifer Watson. I live on Watt Street. I don't think there is a worse place to develop than this site between the traffic and the flooding, the killing of the wildlife. Um, but all the costs will be borne by the neighborhood. Um, and people aren't talking about this, but it's going to cost, I believe, each homeowner hundreds of thousands of dollars as people realize what the neighborhood and what an individual home is up against uh, as it becomes a less desirable place to live. Um, the, the neighborhood definitely wants a no vote on Friday. And Mr. Chairman, I wondered why you said that the uh, HAC would simply rubber stamp the project if the ZBA voted it down. Sure. Um, I'll refer that uh, to Mr. Han um, to Paul Haverty first, just to uh, explain how that appeal works. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe the board, and certainly I have not suggested that the HAC will rubber stamp um, a, a, a overturning a denial by the board. However, the, the odds of a board sustaining a denial at the Housing Appeals Committee are very long. Um, there are very few cases in which on substantive matters, denials by boards have been upheld. Um, certainly that there are, there are a few cases with regards to specific issues, um, 
certain traffic safety issues, um, issues regarding um, ownership of property by other entities, um, requiring town meeting votes, things of that nature, denials have been upheld. Um, but the vast majority of decisions issued by boards of appeals that deny comprehensive permits are ultimately overturned by the Housing Appeals Committee. Um, the statute is designed to foster the creation of affordable housing. The, 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 the scales are stacked against the boards if they issue a denial in the Housing Appeals Committee, and that's the, how the, the statute was intended to operate. And that's the reality that the board has to live with. So you are simply there to negotiate details. Well, the, the board's the role is really to issue a decision that is defensible, that protects the interests of the town and the neighborhood to the greatest extent possible. Um, but they they are unfortunately you know in a position where they need to recognize that a decision that denies this project could actually leave the neighborhood and the town in a much worse position than one that actually approves it with conditions. Maybe the neighbors would like to take that risk. And that might be the case, but ultimately it's the board's determination as to what to issue. Just to, just to, just to clarify, the appeal of the decision does not does not mean that um, they would necessarily be limited to the current proposal that we're discussing. They, the applicant under law would be, can appeal to any prior version of the application that they have made be before the board, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And that's one of the factors, you know, that the board has to weigh in issuing its decision. Yeah, that's the threat. So they would not be limited to the current plan. They could go back to the 176 unit yeah. plan, oh, okay. which would be, you know, significantly larger um, and significantly higher impact. Yeah, that's that's the threat. That's how the process works. Otherwise, everyone would vote no. Right. Well, we will certainly take that into, into consideration as we move forward here. Okay. Were there any other uh, questions or comments? No, I don't think people are, are actually taking the threat of flooding and uh, also the, just the degradation of the environment seriously enough, I think. I think you're kind of caught up in the details, and you know, I, I, I don't I don't know that water can be mitigated to the the uh, standard that it should that that you're talking about. I mean, people all, you know some people already have like two sump pumps in their basement. So the, the neighborhood is already suffering from flooding and the buildings, the houses are, are built in the 40s or the 50s. And the, the project, the, the uh, Thorndike Field project is elevated. Well, that's great for them, but no one else in the neighborhood is elevated. If the water can be mitigated, why do they need to elevate? Right, well, they had elevated relative to um, a report that was issued by the city of Cambridge, which is looking at longer term um, uh, climate change modeling, which um, you know, unfortunately is pretty devastating if the worst of it uh, comes to pass. Um, but that's part of the reason that they have, they have elevated because it current practice that is sort of the, the better thing to do. Um, but I did want to um, also just reiterate uh, the report that uh, John Henshin had issued um, in the last couple of days at the request of Mr. Hanlon um, in regards to the, the impact that this site will have on existing flooding issues. 
um, in the neighborhood. And um, so the, the, the way that this project has been designed, it is designed specifically to not impact the existing flooding um, in the neighborhood. And, um, but by the same token, I don't think it is going to be, you know, making this, the situation, I don't think it's gonna be changing the situation for anyone else in the neighborhood. I think the only thing currently that uh, could change uh, the current condition is if uh, the town is able to improve the rate of drainage um, in the street. I think, you know, if that can be done, that would go a long way towards um, a lot of the, the local flooding issues. But in terms of, you know, the, the current existing flooding problems that are indicative of this neighborhood, um, you know, this, this project is not, should not exacerbate that problem, but it also won't, you know, won't make it better either. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ha yeah, Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there is one area in which it sees arguably that, that the project could make a marginal improvement. Uh, and that's because the Conservation Commission has persuaded the applicant to abide by the local bylaw where for every amount of storage space that is filled in, it has to be compensated by twice as much later on. Now, some of that is probably covering margin of error, but there's at least a marginal increase in storage capacity uh, uh, that would result from that, that would deal with stream flooding. Uh, that being said, much of what's going on in this neighborhood is really local flooding, and the major reasons for it have to do with this town's inadequate stormwater sewer situation, something that this application is not going to make worse, but that ultimately is not going to make better either. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Um, Ms. Watson, unless you have anything else, I would like to move along. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is uh, Will Fuchs. Um, good evening. I'm William Fuchs from 7 Cleveland Street. Um, and I'd like to address some of the issues um, in the draft comprehensive permit under the wetlands floodplain and environmental conditions section. Please. And so I'm um, starting out with I-11, um, which is there should be no sedimentation into wetlands. Um, there's not a, a criteria for if there is um, releases into the wetlands, how, what the timeline should be for reporting or for um, mediation of those if there is a violation. And then in I-17. Yep. This seems to suggest that only nitrogen fertilizers can be used, um, which doesn't identify, you know, it doesn't deal with potassium, phosphorus, micronutrients, or anything like that, um, which are in fact an advantage. Okay. And then it suggests that uh, fertilizer should not be applied after storm events. And I think that should read, should not be applied before storm events. Before a storm event, it would cause runoff of the fertilizer. After storm events, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I-18, um, it does not, does not permit um, the use of herbicides. Um, I do fairly extensive work with the National Park Service on controlling invasive species in wetlands. And um, without the use of herbicides, it's almost impossible to be successful. So I would suggest that um, use of, of herbicides be permitted 
subject to the um, state of Massachusetts regulations and subject to the approval of the appropriate town board, presumably the Conservation Commission. And I believe that was, you had that included in a letter you had written to us previously. That's correct. Okay. And Mr. Chair, this is Marty Nover at the beta group. Um, unfortunately, this, this version doesn't have the edits that the Conservation Commission and I worked on last Friday. And it, it did include, um, it did, the new version that you're not seeing on the screen does have many of the comments that, um, that are being made now, so, but they're good comments. Yeah. Um, on I-24? Yeah. Um, in my experience controlling, first of all, I would, I would separate the issues of invasive species control and um, restoration planting. And secondly, I'd say that um, controlling invasive species for initial control requires typically at least five years. And that after that initial period, it requires um, continuous maintenance to prevent the invasive species from returning at a later date. So I think that the, the three year time period, at least in terms of invasive species control is not adequate and really should be in perpetuity. Anything further? Um, yeah, in I-25, really I-25, I-34, and I-35, um, those three um, those three sections seem to um, prohibit invasive species control because they're not shown on the plans um, and do create a disturbance. And so I think that invasive species control should be specifically exempted in from those three sections. Okay. And those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so Ms. Nover, just to go back on those. So in the I section, that was number 11, uh, 17, 18, uh, 24, and 25. That's correct, with the addition of, in that same note, 34 and 35. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Marcy Eide. Hi, yes. Um, Marcy Eide. I live at the corner of Lake Street and Little John Streets. Um, I don't even know where to start. I'm, you know, have been here since the beginning of this whole seven plus year process. I have never seen such a hostile 40B situation where I have not heard any residents who are for a giant building to be built in the wetlands. Whether you call them wetlands, floodplain, et cetera, et cetera, it's one of the very last undeveloped parcels in this area. And I don't think we're being heard. I don't think any of the residents are being heard. I also want to say that we can call this affordable housing, but it's not. It is maybe 25% affordable housing. So to get back to what Mr. McKinnon was saying, if it is not 100% affordable housing units, somebody is profiting. That's the bottom line. And I think we need to be honest about that. So I have written many letters over the past seven years. Um, 
I truly feel that just because you only have to have a certain percentage of affordable housing, if you really are truly in it for the affordable housing, it has to be fully affordable. And that is what the town needs. If you look at all the housing plans, you look at all the, the Envision Arlington, you know, groups, what people are saying, there was a, a meeting tonight about affordable housing, making something, you know, sneaking it in under this 40B, it's just very discouraging. So I just, I know that's not part of what the ZBA can put in terms of conditions, but I just really want the developers and the owners of this property to think long and hard because this is impacting many people. And as someone who works with older adults who can't afford market rate housing, this is still gonna be at least 75% market rate housing and that goes up every single year. So I just want people to think long and hard about that and what we're really doing here. Um, I'm very concerned about the traffic. I don't think any of the traffic studies have been done, not during the pandemic. I think they've all been done during the pandemic. And the traffic around here, obviously, as it did everywhere, significantly decreased during the pandemic. I will say what Ms. Kiefer was referring to before as far as those uh, signs that uh, prohibit entering, um, it's left or right turns, it says do not enter in the morning in the evening. That was something that the uh, residents of the neighborhood for years uh, requested and the select board finally granted because of the traffic cutting through the neighborhood during both um, rush hours as uh, Matt McKinnon had mentioned, cutting up Mary Street to bypass most of Lake Street. Um, and there was a significant tra traffic problem and it was a huge concern with the number of kids at the time walking to and from school, as well as people on bicycles, as well as the number of accidents in the neighborhood. And so that's something that the select board was very supportive of imposing. So I think, to say that we don't, yes, that Dorothy Road maybe has been very, very quiet in 400 more trips a day. When you're talking about we have 30 trips a day, I don't see how anybody can say that's not significant. And also, like I said, I don't think that any of these studies have been done when it wasn't a pandemic. And you can't use pandemic numbers to, to say what's going to happen um, once this building is built. So those are my main points. I also think the building is way too big. I would love to see a, a something that says it should be half the size. It's still too big a building. If anybody were to come down and walk along this area and try to envision right in front of you what this is going to look like, it's way too big. Especially if you add in seven townhouses in front of it or seven. 14 residences, whatever. So I just really want everybody to kind of think about that a little bit more. Um, and uh, I think that's it. I had something else, but <laughs> I'm not sure I forgot what it was, but I just really am hoping that, you know, people can use, we can use our common sense and really, you know, think about what's the right thing to do here. So thank you for your time. Thank you to the ZBA for all your you know, work and hours. Oh, I also don't think that the, um, we haven't had enough time to review everything. So I really think that the public uh, comment period needs to be extended. I mean, this feels like a very rushed thing at the end. There are so many details that I don't think and there are so many questions left unanswered and there are still many residents that just found out about the project this week and because we haven't been able to meet in person and and be out you know doing what we did at the hardy school six or seven years ago i really really strongly suggest we extend the public comment per period because it feels you know it sounds counterintuitive but it feels very rushed here at, at this point, I don't understand how this is the end. 
when we're just getting this new, you know, two months ago, a month ago, we got new plans. And there's two different formats and people are writing on different things. It's a lot to review and to have, you know, residents have to give comments by this Friday just seems very, very rushed. So I really am hoping that that can be extended too. Well, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Um, I did want to quickly ask, um, uh, is Kiefer, who sets the affordability limits on a project like this, the, either the number of units or the percentages? Uh, pursuant to 40B, it's um, 25%. Right, but who is that something that the applicant decides wh whether it's 25 or 35 or 45% or is that the subsidizing agency that's making that determination? It's the subsidizing agency, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Haverty. Welcome. And there's actually a specific provision in the regulations that states that a board can impose conditions requiring greater affordability than what's required by the subsidizing agency. Um, I'm sorry, did you say can? No, they cannot. can it impose cannot. more affordability or they can't? They cannot. There's a specific provision in the DHCD regulations that says the board can impose a condition that would require the project to provide more low or moderate income housing units than the minimum threshold required by the department's guidelines. And that's the 25%. Next on my list is Nicholas Ide. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Nicholas Ide. I live at 152 Lake Street, which is the corner of Lake and Little John. Um, to echo what I think I heard Mr. Mills and Mr. Hanlon say, you know, there have been a lot of changes, and it, it's there's a lot of documents to look at, and it really feels, uh, as Marcy said as well, to be in a rushed manner without final documents. I mean, here we are in the end game, and everything's all redlined, which is crazy. And what I heard is this was published this morning, and not everyone who wants to have a chance to look at it has looked at it. Uh, while the meeting proceeded, I was looking at the larger agenda document that was linked to this meeting that was labeled Agenda 2021-105 Meeting 1393.pdf, and there's many changes in there as well. Um, I'd like to point out a change, uh, some missing key data, which was addressed a bit verbally here, but not in the document, and a piece of key data that's outdated, and this is all relating to the two key residential concerns that we brought up again and again and again, traffic and flooding. And Mr. McKinnon brought it up, Marcy brought it up, others have brought it up. I'm gonna bring it up again because I, I just, I also wanna be heard and I appreciate the chance to be heard here. So the first items refer to page 19 uh, on that document that I mentioned here, that's part of this agenda, uh, where the traffic, uh, the, the data for the traffic predictions, predictions has been struck. And there isn't anything written up about the current resident trips and resident traffic counts within the bounds of the neighborhood, as opposed to this larger mm -hmm. Lake Street workflow, Lake Street flow. So we got the, the verbal data tonight about, uh, <laughs> the, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, someone keeps interrupting as so I'm talking, I'm sorry. Um, we got verbal data tonight that implies if you had you know 400 trips, uh, assuming uh, an 18-hour uh, uh, day, that's 12 extra trips per hour. If you assume a 12-hour day, that's 33 extra trips per hour. Comparing those numbers with what was said about what's coming in currently off of Lake Street, that's very significant, right? So those numbers that I just quoted, based on you know 40 divided by 18, or, or sorry, 400 divided by 18, or 400 divided by 12 seem awful close to that peak value that was listed where it was, oh, nonchalant, it's just a peak and you know not so bad. I, I live here, I'm concerned about that. So it's not really clear if this unpublished baseline that was talked about tonight is really just neighborhood traffic or if it includes the cut-throughs, which it probably does. 
And they're just really not sure how a decision can be made without this information in the document of record. Because if stuff gets denied and it goes to HAC, all they see is the document of record. They don't understand what's happening to us here in this neighborhood and what the neighborhood is. If they think it's what's Vox on two, that is not this neighborhood. We are not on route two. This is a sleepy neighborhood. It's very different. So, you know, our concern, as Mr. McKinnon mentioned, is really how the traffic in our neighborhood, the people that live here, how that's going to change, right? Very concerned. I mean, there's kids that play on the street all over the place here, even when it's not pandemic times, because it's a quiet neighborhood. It's not a place where you have Route 2, Mass Ave, huge things. It's just not there. So that's traffic. Uh, regarding the flooding concern, please note that the map that is on page 125 is over 11 years old, and it is not accurate. I just looked up on the FEMA site tonight. Uh, the more recent map from FEMA indicates a greater risk of flooding within the neighborhood. Uh, I personally live, honest to goodness, about 20 feet from the border of where I can get flood insurance, okay? And the data that is currently there, from what I understand from a conversation I had with someone recently, and from what I remember from my neighbor telling me when it was published about 10 years ago, is that that map is 10 years old, which means that it's probably moved again, and it's not moving into a way that's favorable for me or anyone else in this neighborhood. I can tell you that the neighbor next door has sump pumps that run all the time, as is. And it's always been that way. And it's gotten, well, it's, it's gotten worse the, over the last couple of years. So I'm very concerned with this. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of people in a higher risk zone than me. In fact, there's two higher risk zones than me between here and the, and the project, which is like 100 yards away. So it's, it's ridiculous. Um, again, I'm just not sure how a decision can be made based on this outdated data that's in the document of record uh, for one of the most key issues that residents like myself have repeatedly raised. So I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, I just want to say, if it went to the HAC for appeal, right? So I know that if the ZBA denies this, it goes to the HAC. Uh, you know, we've been advised that, you know, most of the time that'll get overturned. Okay, fine. My concern is that it feels like what the HAC is going to see and get and see is not a full picture of what the actual impact would be for this actual neighborhood, for actual people that lives here, what actually happens. This neighborhood was not and is not designed for a project of this size. It just isn't. There's not the space for something that size. It's, I'm sorry, it's just not there. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit agitated, but as a resident, I'm extremely grateful to have been heard multiple times by the CBA. I appreciate so much the time that everyone has put into coming into these meetings, to listening to all of us in the public. Appreciate it so much. But what I am deathly fearful of is that there is no one at the state level who is going to listen to reason about the inappropriateness of the scope of this project. It's been said many times, six duplex units would be great. We don't care, we would love it if it's 100% affordable housing for heaven's sakes. That's not the issue. The issue is that that large building does not belong here. It just doesn't belong here. It simply is not a fit. In closing, I'd just like to say again, thank you, but also it seems uh, beneficial if, if we could extend the public comment period. It just seems like this is all a big rush. Stuff is still in flux and changing. In the last meeting, I mentioned something and the developers mentioned something about, oh, well, maybe it won't be modular units. For heaven's sakes, we've been hearing about modular units for seven years. Why is that all of a sudden going to change? It's just so frustrating. So happy to be heard by the ZBA. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, uh, Chairman Klein and the rest of the ZBA. But again, so afraid that at the state level, we are just not going to ever be heard. Thank you very much. Uh, Pat, this yeah, there we go. There we go. No, I'm off Christian, mute and I'm back on the call. Christian, I have you loud and clear. Um, perfect. Okay. Somehow I got kicked off the call there for a minute, but I, I am back. Um, next on my list um, is Heather Keith Lucas. Thank you, Chairman Klein. This is Heather Absolutely. Keith Lucas of 10 Mott Street. Please go ahead. Okay. 
Uh, I want to number one, thank you and the board for their thoughtful engagement in this process. I know there's been a lot of many hours that you've listened to the local concerns and have attempted to truly understand those local local concerns. So my my comments today are to um, to broaden upon upon that. Following up on Mr. McKinnon and, and Ms. Ides and Mr. Ides uh, comments about the traffic. Um, the, the additional 412 car trips over the 12 hours basically brings us a current rush hour all day um, if you applied that consistently. Um, so just please keep that in mind when we're thinking about traffic. Moving on, just thinking a um, couple of procedural comments and questions for the board. Is the board able to introduce additional conditions that may not be in this current draft? And the reason I ask is previously, I recall discussions about pilings not being pounded into the property um, to not have structural impacts on the neighborhood existing homes. That's only one example um, that comes to mind, but I imagine as the board moves into deliberations, as this has gone very quickly to, to the draft version and the draft version has um, been modified significantly just uh, even in the time that we've had in the past few days to review this, uh, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I imagine you may find additional conditions that may need to be added in an attempt to um, mitigate local concerns. So my question again is, is the board able to introduce additional conditions they, that may not be currently reflected in the draft that was reviewed tonight? Um, we certainly can. Um, up until the time we, we, we vote, we can be adjusting the the conditions and the the findings will pretty much need to be um, solidified when we close the public hearing because we can't take any new testimony, so there's nothing new to find. But the conditions and the uh, the waivers we can continue to work on. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Can I just? I don't actually. While we can't adopt new findings based on evidence that we don't have in the record at at the time we stop. Um, there is quite a lot that we can do in, and I think we ought to do uh, in the finding section to emphasize certain things to, there are certain kinds of things where there are data, like much of the traffic that we've been talked about has a lot of numbers that are buried in a report that are not in the current draft, but that are in the record. And we can turn back to those and rely on those uh, as much as I want that we want. Uh, at the same time, if, if we were so inclined, we could de-emphasize things that relate to the transit-oriented nature of this and focus more on the neighborhood compatibility issues that Mr. I is talking about. Uh, we're quite free to exercise our judgment on the, on the facts that are in the record. The one thing we can't do is get new facts. Um, but we have lots of flexibility, both in the conditions and in the and in the finding section to make to write our opinion. What is currently before everybody is not our opinion. It is a draft that is presented for, for us to uh, decide what our opinion should be, and we can we could throw it all away and start all over if we wanted to. Uh, we're not bound by anything that has happened now, except that we have to respect not base anything on information that is provided to us uh, after the hearing is closed. May I ask a follow-up to that, yeah. Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. When the board makes their decision final, and it's in, in forgive me, I don't know all of the right terminology, but when it's when it's filed as the final decision, is that the only document that is used if an appeal goes forward by either the um, the abutters or by the applicant themselves? Mr. Haverty, can you address that? Well, I mean, the decision is the applicable document that would be appealed um, by the applicant or if it's a, an approval with conditions by an aggrieved party. Um, 
it's not the only document that will have any relevance in the proceeding as it moves forward. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that the proceeding before the Housing Appeals Committee is not a uh, on the record appeal, nor would a, an appeal brought by an aggrieved party to Superior Court or Land Court be an on the record appeal. They're both what's known as de novo appeals, which means that new evidence can be established and brought into the record in those proceedings. Um, so I think th this is sort of addressing the question from one of the prior commenters. Um, the, the, the state in its review at the Housing Appeals Committee or the courts in its review are free to look at whatever information is introduced during those proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Haverty. My final question is, is more with respect to the draft itself and just the timing. Um, it seemed like a number of the descriptions of our neighborhood were redlined, in other words, deleted, uh, which in, and in one case of the descriptions um, was inaccurate regarding the, the turning into three of the streets being do not right turn only when it was a do not enter. Um, so I just want to emphasize that from the perspective of the local concerns, I think we, in order for the board to also demonstrate how they've heard from the local community about our concerns, just to the extent that you can and you're able to include as robust and as accurate a description of our local neighborhood, um, that would that would feel better, um, even if it doesn't um, render the decision that that we are looking for. Um, it is disappointing given how engaged a number of us have been through through this process, um, how quickly everything has been moving and um, not being able to read or respond to a clean version of of the draft uh, is, I don't know, it just is disappointing. So not having that time. If there was additional time or an additional way to provide comments back, um, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And certainly the, the thing you had mentioned initially about the pilings and things that are revolving around construction, we will okay. absolutely track the back down because those are supposed to be in there. Great. So in that um, case, Mr. Connect. Chairman, would that mean yeah. that prior comments that I've submitted to the board, uh, would those still be referenced as you go through this draft review? Absolutely, because I know you have, I believe you had submitted recently. Um, yeah, so you had submitted a letter in the last week, which I have not had a chance to incorporate yet. And then I have your prior letter or prior letters. I know you had extensive comments on the, the April draft as well which we'll yes, go back and take a look at. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mr. Absolutely. Chairman, and for the members of the ZBA. You're very welcome, thank you. Um, next on my list is uh, Erin Freeberger. Hello, thank you. I wanted to share um, a specific concern, a larger concern, and a comment. So the specific- your address for the record. Oh, thank that. you. Um, my address is 20 Parker Street. Um, I'm on Parker Street uh, between Dorothy and Mott. And for the specific Thanks. concern, um, what I haven't seen is um, as we're learning and trying to understand the impact, traffic flooding and other things as well, um, before we get into the development of the land and building onto it, I'm curious about the impact of removing the trees to begin with. And so what I haven't seen is a list of plant life and wildlife that's on the land. Um, the number of, of trees, the variety of trees, um, the sizes and ages to better understand as that um, plant life acts as a, as a sponge um, before we get even into the other parts of it, 
um, I think it's important for us to know what's currently on the land. Um, so when that has to be removed, we can have a better understanding of it. My second larger concern speaks to a lot of the anger and passion. Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm just gonna interrupt you. Sorry, I just want to interrupt you for a second. I don't know if anybody, if it affected everybody else. Um, I was having a lot of trouble hearing that first part. So I, I apologize, but if you wouldn't mind just repeating it. Um, yes, can you hear me? Just you're freezing up a bit. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I can pause my video if that helps with the bandwidth. So my concern was, um, I haven't seen an assessment of the flora and fauna on the land. I haven't seen a list of the trees and the plants, the numbers and the types. I think this is important for us to know because of the, the sponge uh, effect that trees have on our land. So simply having an assessment um, from someone to be able to say what is currently on the land that would be removed and the, the known impact that it would have um, by the sizes and types of trees being removed and then that extra water that they would be absorbing would be going into the land. So I would like, um, I would like to see more information on that. Is the audio still okay? Would you like me to continue? Yeah. Okay. That'd be great if you could continue. Uh, so my larger concern is when I hear from the the neighbors and the um, that the concern and the anger and the passion that I keep hearing is that we are being involved um, and being exposed to understanding what will be an irreversible decision, and we're being asked to comment and react to it with insufficient information. And so there's an irreversibility that it's gonna have on every single neighbor here. Um, and we're just getting frustrated by when we ask about these same questions and comments and doesn't feel that we're getting um, that sufficient level of, of detail. And that's just a larger concern I wanted to share. My final comment is we do have a very uh, active and engaged neighborhood and I am happy to see a lot of the um, similar faces um, of my neighbors here online. And I just wanted to also represent the many, many neighbors who cannot be here tonight, but share our concerns um, and are equally um, engaged and active in this as well. So for every person who's you know, showing their face on it, um, there is a family behind them um, and other neighbors as well. So I just wanted to have a chance to represent um, those who haven't been able to spend the hours and hours that we've been able to put in on this um, to just illustrate our united front and our passion towards um, being a good steward of our neighborhood. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so the, the last person on the list for a first time is Mr. Uh, DiBiase. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Robert DiBiase, 29 Little John Street. I live directly next door to what will be the entrance to this project. Um, so far, I've just listened to a lot of the um, numbers and so forth go forward about how many trips back and forth people will be doing between home well, renters and employees. Um, we have a Nest Cam that basically picks up anybody that drives by the front of the house here. So far, there hasn't been a single traffic study done at the point of entry here, where we're looking at at this point of Dorothy and Little John Street. My Nest Cam picks up anywhere from 40 to 50 cars on a given day. So now if you're gonna add another 400 trips percentage-wise, I think that number should be stated so that if an appeal goes forward, you're gonna look at what the percentage is. You're looking at a thousand percent increase on what we're looking at right now today. This is the end of this little cul-de-sac area where nobody really cuts through. On a given Saturday or Sunday, you will see people playing pickleball in front of my home. They don't move the net at all because barely nobody comes down the street. 
which is a very quiet and peaceful area. We've stated that in the past many numerous times over and over again. Uh, I think that, you know, if this goes to appeal, the percentage number should be stated and it should be accurate. No traffic study has been done in front of this home or at the entry of this unit. This is going to be a large development put in right next to my home directly. So I am a direct abutter to the point that it's immediately to my right, looking out my front windows. So the traffic to me is at the most. And I feel that, you know, given all the data that's just been brought out today and all the different structures, it hasn't been able to be digested and read thoroughly. Um, that, you know, all the abutters or everybody in this neighborhood or anybody that attends these meetings should have the time to really go through these drafts, understand them, and then be able to comment. Uh, you can't comment on something that came out this morning and been at work all day and been una unable to read. Uh, so I would like to take that and have you put that in. Thank you very much for all your work and all your help. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Let's see. Um, oh, we have Ms. Martell. Um, is it? It was out in the for the first time. Ms. Martell? Yes, so they have out there. Yeah. But just when you went out, um, they were, uh, she's beyond your tools. Like. Aline Martell? You're on mute. Hi. Hi. Helene Martell, 7 Osborne Road. Am I on? You are. Okay. So I am one of those people who have, I have two cast iron sump pumps. They were just recently replaced because the old ones burnt out because they work continuously all the time. And I wonder if anybody was over here about a week ago after the, that major um, rainfall, specifically, did anybody go over to um, the entrance of where this um, monstrosity would be? Because it was a lake, as was my neighborhood, Osborne, Edith, Margaret Street. Um, if anybody came over here, you would see that water was gushing out of, I have a setup that I have to put out or I should put out every time there's major rain expected of hoses and pipes that go down to the curb. And I know my new neighbors across the street, their basement flooded. Even with my setup and my sump pumps, we got water in the basement. And um, it was a, clearly what we're, FEMA has designated us as, a floodplain. Um, I've only lived here for 24 years. At the time, my daughter was 10, and I remember telling her I was going to a meeting on the um, proposal to develop the park at Thorndike Field. That was, um, as I said, 24 years ago. 10 year old, her comment was, but it's already developed. It's a habitat for the animals. And I think the wisdom of a child, you're not developing it, um, you're destroying it. So um, the common sense of all my articulate, knowledgeable neighbors, I think, um, you know, we live here, we know the neighborhood, and um, this is just um, so out of scale. Um, it's very obvious in um, traffic, flooding, um, environmental destruction. So I um, thank all my neighbors for articulating that so well. And I think if you close down the public commentary after having this new document come out, that clearly needs more review by more people. It's it's just um, it's a travesty. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then I have uh, Steve Moore for a second time. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I I want to uh, thank Mr. Haverty for 
his uh, succinct laying out of uh, the potential outcomes of the 40B process, depending on the um, action of the board. Um, because unfortunately it is, the outcomes are, are limited and have um, serious implications for whatever ends up on this property. I, the frustration of the uh, abutters and the neighbors is absolutely clear. Um, and I know that they've been working on this for, for many years. I am not actually an abutter, uh, but I am a neighbor of Arlingtonian. Um, and I know that the big issue right now is the length of review at the most recent uh, complete documents. And I understand that frustration and that um, they're being changed right up until the last minute. And it's a little tough to uh, digest them and respond to them in a very foreshortened time frame. However, uh, it is clear the time frame for this project has been extremely long, and it is a little ironic that at the last minute we seem to be uh, running short of uh, time, uh, certainly for public comment and public review. Um, all, that, all that being said, um, it's not possible for the town or the residents or the neighbors to deny the new bears the right to develop this land. Um, it has not been developed for foreseeable past. However, now there is a desire to develop it. It's been going on for some more than 10 years and it's coming to some sort of fruition right now. Um, that, that is the right of the current owners. I know that it will have impacts on the neighborhood for sure, um, but it probably is not within the right of the abutters to request it in as is an undeveloped in permanent fashion. Um, that being said, also, I think I want to thank the ZBA for the work that it's done. Right now, there's a series of strong conditions which have been placed on the project. Um, the uh, applicants have been uh, working with the ZBA, though not always, not always happily, but, but um, there have been a number of uh, conditions and, and uh, certain decisions and uh, work that's brought us to where we are now. Um, if the ZBA is to vote this down, all of the conditions, all of that compromise, all the work that's brought us to where we are now, which is by, certainly not perfect, not even close to perfect. It's, in, it's probably as, as good a deal as can be gotten at this point. All of those conditions, all of that compromise goes away. And it's pretty clear that at the state level, the state uh, would probably uh, sustain any sort of appeal that was brought by the applicant if the board was to turn this down. I think that is sadly the reality, whether it's desired or not, that is the reality of a 40B project, particularly where we are now. So I would counsel trusts in the boards, the Conservation Commission, the ZBA, the uh, various planning, uh, entities in town that have commented and moved us to where we are now in a, in a somewhat of a compromised position. As imperfect as it is, it's, it's better than no conditions at all. Uh, sadly, that is, is where we have to, where we have to, where we have to live and reside. Anyway, that's just my, my small opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Fuchs? Um, I wanted to say some of the same things that Steve said. Um, you know, I think it's a bad site in terms of wetlands and the surrounding neighborhoods and that we are really rushed at the end. But I think that um, I'd like to commend the extraordinary effort by the applicant, um, as well as the ZBA and uh, other town boards to address both the municipal and residential concerns. And I think that we have ended up with a substantially better project for the residents and for the town than was originally um, proposed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so I've had two more people raise their hands again. So I'm gonna go with those two and then um, we've been at it for three and a half hours. So I would like to um, try to winnow down the evening if I can. Um, Lee Martell for a second time. 
Or is your hand just still up? I'm sorry. Um, how do I put it down? <laughs> oh, I can do it for you. Oh, I see. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, then I know Mr. McKinnon had his hand up. Now it's down. Did you want to speak for a second time or were you all set? Uh, no, I, I did want to speak for a second time. Uh, Matt McKinnon, 9 Little John Street. Yep. I, you know, I, when explaining this project to neighbors who haven't heard of it before or family and friends, uh, you know, I, there's a name behind it and that name's Mugar. Um, and when I explained the Mugar family, I explained the philanthropy behind the family and all the great things they've done uh, in Massachusetts. And I just hope if the Mugar is listening right now, they see that there's a lot of negativity here, uh, a lot of anger and frustration and concern um, about a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want that name to leave a stain on a community when there's been so many other great things that they've done. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So looking around, I don't see any other hands up. So I will close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for their participating in, and sharing all their knowledge of this neighborhood. Um, obviously, the, the residents know this neighborhood so much better than we do. Um, and all of their their comments and observations are, uh, are essential to this process. We thank them for that. Um, so at this point, the question for the board is, do we have sufficient information to close the public hearing tonight and move on to the deliberation phase? Um, I will say there's been so much new information that has been coming out over the last couple of days. Um, and certainly things have been expressed this evening in terms of um, the information being clear and understanding what's really included and what's not included. Um, I, I personally have some reservations, but Mr. Revelak, I see your hand is up. No, um, I, I would, for my own preference, I would like to see us leave public comment open until Friday. Um, I would like to get the con the you know, at the very least, the commentary from the conservation and obviously from anyone else who, um, you know, cares to submit between now and then. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Han yeah, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm inclined to agree with that and with what some other people have said, uh, but I would like to just put it more bluntly, the period I mean, we may be forced because the applicant has the right to decide whether we get additional time or not. Um, I have been struck by the number of times this evening where something has come up and where a provision that we have talked about sometimes months ago that I have seen in some drafts that have been flying around didn't happen to be in this one. And it seems to me that in any event, we are going to need, before we start deliberations, a consolidated draft that has everything in it. Uh, and that really is official so that if it isn't in that draft and it isn't anywhere and we need to put it there, uh, and it would be a much better process. I mean, it is inevitable that we will have to prepare a draft like that because otherwise I don't see how we can do a deliberation. And that gets clear as to what's in and what's out. It gets clear as to what the advice of the Conservation Commission is. And I hate to put them in the situation where they have, what, 48 hours to get something, and then we can't even ask them about it. Um, we need this extra time. Uh, we, we're not entitled to it. We just have to ask for it. But a process where we basically are like jugglers with all the balls in the air and we have to call time while they're still in the air is not something that's conducive to a process that's either orderly for us or gives an opportunity for the neighborhood to really focus on what is what is before us and to sign off on it. I'm not sure that I think that another evening like this one is necessary or, or helpful. Uh, but I do think that people ought to have time to review a consolidated draft that says this is what is going into deliberation 
and to say, I, I do like this, I don't like that, you need to do something so that we can go in there with with a record where we can where we can see it all. Um, and we just can't do that. We certainly can't do that tonight. We really can't do that in two days either. Um, we could easily do it in two weeks. We could get a consolidated draft by the middle of next week and leave it on the table for some limited period of time. We're not talking about a really long extension here, um, but it leaves a bad taste, frankly, for us to be in a position where where we have to take a record that's, that's this disorganized. And I'm not certainly not blaming anyone for that. It's disorganized because lots of people are paying a lot of attention to it and have lots of ideas and they're all coming in and it's like drinking out of a fire hose. So I would like the applicant to consider uh, providing us enough time to really master this procedure, uh, get it orderly, make sure that we have everything that we think we have in the draft. And then when we go into deliberations, we can breathe a sigh of relief and, and know that we're starting from a good place. Thank you, Mr. Van. Other comments from the board? Chairman. Yep. Oh, go ahead, Sean. I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Mr. Hanlon. With, uh, I don't think we need another full hearing, but we need time to get a single draft in place that incorporates Conservation Commission and beta, and then uh, have it available for public comment for people to comment on. I don't think that's going to need, we're not going to need a lot of time, but something like that Mr. Hanlon is stating, I think is efficient. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mills? I completely concur, and I don't necessarily believe the public comment period should be limited either. I think the citizens of this town deserve to see a consolidated document that they can understand, digest, and then make their comments and questions on. I think that's the least we owe these neighbors and citizens. Thank you, and I'd appreciate if the applicant could make that consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mills. So this is a, a request from the board going back to the applicant. Um, I mean, obviously the public comment period is currently scheduled to expire on Friday. Um, and it's been you know, made known to us previously that the, the ownership um, is interested in closing out this, out this process. Um, but for the reasons that been you know stated so eloquently by uh, Mr. Hanlon um, and by you know, many of the people who spoke this evening, the process could only benefit by having additional time to really go through this draft and really understanding um, you know what's in it, what's not in it. Make sure we have it correct um, so that the board can go into a deliberation with a document that it feels confident will, that you know, has um, at least been fully seen by uh, those who will be affected by it and, and those departments and, and uh, boards and commissions in town who are gonna have to, um, uh, you know, not necessarily enforce it, but are gonna have to um, implement it. So is there room in the in the applicant's schedule to extend the public comment period on this project? Chairman, I'm sorry, you cut out. Could you repeat that? Oh, sure. Um, is there I think that per what Mr. Hanlon said and what you know, a lot of people have reiterated, would it be would the applicant be amenable to extending the public comment period for a period of two weeks? So instead of closing on Friday the eighth, we would be closing on Friday the twenty second of October. Um. 
so I, I think, Mr. Chairman, there are there are a couple of um, considerations coming into play, and and I do understand the board's concern with the the multiple drafts um, and, and which version. Um, but I, 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 I just want to make clear that in, in part, it's not so much new information that, um, that needs to come in. I mean, the, the project application is, is the project that, you know, it's the plans that have been submitted, it's the reports, it's the peer review. Um, so that's kind of the, the project information, um, and, and the board's work in, reviewing the project and coming to a decision is, is, is somewhat a different issue. And, and sometimes it's even done, um, full, the board closes the hearing, nobody comments, and the board issues its decision in the 40 days. Um, but you know, with that said, I do appreciate um, that the board is taking its job very seriously and wants to make certain that it has um, the comment received. And my concern, though, is the, the length that you're requesting of two weeks. Um, I, I think that the applicant might be amenable to a shortened extension. Um, and again, not trying to be difficult, but this, this project has been going on for quite a while with a lot of information. And I think that some of the, some of the questions that people may have, it's, it's really just going back and, and Finding it within the record, there is a, a lot in the record. There, I don't think that there was any new verbal testimony that was given. It was, it was um, on behalf of the applicant. It was explaining what's already in the document. Um, so, with that said, we had talked about previously. Um, you had suggested Tuesday that the board had a hearing open. The the twelfth, I think the date is. We do have a hearing scheduled for the twelfth. Where we have five cases on that evening. If let me propose this: if the concern is that the board wants to make certain that it gets a you know a working consolidated draft and then comments coming in on that, um, wouldn't there be time then just to? I mean, I don't think that the board needs further public testimony. That the board just wants to make certain that if there's written comments coming in. Um, to to have it continue to that and that provides that extra time it doesn't i don't think it, that it requires i don't i mean the, the the project is what the project is and um and i and, and um i think it's a good project and i think it's it's much improved from what we um had had looked at five years ago and you know in part that's the board and you know other par parts of this project that the the improvements is there is more clarity it, it's it is designed you know to address climate change um and i think that uh john's memo actually like tying in the various plans and reports is, is great and there's also the memo that that we presented kind of underscoring the benefit of 12 acres of open space that this project would create that that doesn't presently exist it's not a reality it's nothing well there's not a development on the property now there's no assurance that there's going to be 12 acres that are preserved in, in perpetuity. And I don't think that that fact should be lost by, by anybody. Um, and that there's a commitment to, you know, improve the condition of not, not just the developed piece, but the, the open space piece. Um, and, and so it's a long winded way of saying that I'm not certain that new testimony is coming in as to the project impacts. And it's just on the comments of the draft decision. And so I think that if the board wants that additional time, that it, it could be done by the 12th. That way it kind of, it, it, it meets in between where the applicant and the owner wants the, you know, the hearing process to, you know, come to some sort of conclusion after five, six years. Um, and the board wants to make certain that it has um, provided for itself and, and you know, the, the town departments and the neighbors to provide their written comments. Mr. Chairman. Anna? Um, I think that the, the ambiguity here that we need to address is that the board is going to make a decision. It's not building a project. 
uh, the project may be fixed and the applicant may be ready to go. But what we're interested in is making a piece of paper work as a legal document and to do the things it needs to do. Now, a month ago, uh, as we were getting a lot of information in from the applicant and lots of other people, um, I mentioned that we needed the time from now till then so the applicant could comment not on what the applicant's project was, but what the applicant thought of all of the conditions and what they thought of all of the legal obligations that were going to flow. And the applicant took, what, about two and a half weeks to be able to, to, to produce that. Uh, and they have resources to work all, all, all day at it. Uh, I personally, I mean, I'm retired. I could probably work all day too. But what, until you have a, a consolidated draft, which is not easy to do with all of these, with all of the drafts that are going around, that's going to take a number of days. And then to publish it so that people can see it and give us their advice as to what they think about the conditions, whether they think they're, they're enough, whether there's something we're overlooking, the same kinds of comments on the conditions that the applicant has already provided to us with more time to do it than the citizens are going to have. And I just think that you're that it's pushing too much. We're going to find ourselves in a situation where the time will slip. We won't be able to get everything together. It'll be late before we're able to get a consolidated draft. And what's going to happen on the 12th is a lot of people complaining that we that we went through, we did a a, a a too fast job that turns out to be a half fast job. And I think that we need to we need to. I mean, we're talking a week here, in the overall scheme of things, that's. That's not a long time. I don't really even understand why it should be a huge issue, um, but it seems to me that if you're going to have an orderly process, you have an orderly process, and we should we should just commit ourselves to doing that, and and let it get done. Uh, and we're very close. We're very close. And the applicant has had a good shot. Many of the agencies have had a good shot, but they haven't really finished everything that they wanted to do and given it to us. And the people need to have their shot. And then let's wrap it up and we'll go into a decision. And I promise you, we'll come up with a decision. And it, you know, we may even be able to try to do the decision in, in 35 days if the applicant is really so worried about every given day. Um, but, but we should just let, let, it, let the process work. And don't try to force it in a way that ultimately will lead people to think that because we rushed it in a certain way, that people who needed to be heard on this document didn't get heard. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, thank you very much. Your, your points are very well taken. Um, I, I guess one thing that I kind of like maybe the board to give some feedback on to like make that process then move forward smoothly is like, would there be a time where there would like I, I guess I just don't want there to be a situation if we have an extension and then we're at that date and then additional feedback comes in and says, but I didn't get a, an opportunity. So is there a way to have that process be, you know, like, to, and I know it's hard for you to say, but do you have an idea when you would be able to like circulate, what, would it be yet this week, the, the combined draft of, I think that the version that was up on the screen is is just missing the the beta input that came in at, at some point today. And I know that those comments on that one were actually on a prior draft to that the planning and community development merge document that you were showing. So it's it I, I understand that it's a you have to like combine and then recognize that those comments were in on a prior draft, but does the board think that that would be something that would be available yet this week? So, so at least if we have, if we can agree upon a future date, we at least know what document we're working on to provide comments to. And and I say that you know on behalf of the, you know the town staff as well as the applicant or anyone in the public. Mr. Chairman, if I could just, uh, I I envision that the very first step is a consolidated draft. Uh, Ms. Chapnick has had a lot of things that she was promising us to get together by Friday. There were some other questions that came up. Uh, and however we go forward, we need to have a consolidated draft. I'm not sure that we can do this by, by the time we light the candles on Friday night, but I do think that 
that if people work during the weekend, we can have it early. The, the point is just really to make sure that everything that we think is in this draft is in it. I don't want to, for example, find out if it's true that the pile driving issue, which we've talked about now for months uh, and was always intended to be in there. Um, I don't even know whether that's in there. At least one of the witnesses tonight said that they didn't think so. Um, but, you know, going and finding all that stuff that we expected to be in it and making sure it's all there when the project is, you know, when it grew just the way it did, um, is going to require just some time to go through a bunch of information and, and consolidate it. Um, so Friday night, I think is possibly too, too fast. Monday, I don't necessarily think is, is uh, so a lot will have to do with, with Mr. Haverty's schedule. And but my view would be we get a, res a respectable draft that's consolidated and has in it everything that we think should be in it, and then to leave it out for a number of days so that people can read it and give us their suggestions on it. And I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't want it to get lost that you know, the zoning board of appeals is a volunteer board, we all have you know, nine to five jobs we're trying to maintain i had to take the day off from work today to try to get ready for this hearing um you know and that there's so there's a lot of sacrifice that the, the board has to make to make these things happen quickly and a lot of it is not stuff that we're able to necessarily drop everything and you know turn this stuff around and i know it sounds simple to say oh we just need to add this together we need to put this in but you know that's that's a lot of different documents to go through over a period of, you know, two years uh, to make sure that we were looking at everything. And, you know, Mr. At Paul's got a, you know, he's got a regular job too that, you know, that that he needs to take care of that work as well. So um, yeah, I, I don't want to get, you know, I, I, I appreciate that it's been going on for a very long time and that it's important to the owner that get concluded in this that we move on, but, you know, it, we, you know, on behalf of the board, I'm asking to be, you know, fair to us as well, that we who are doing this, you know, as a second career on top of the first career that we, you know, we have the ability and the time to do this accurately and well. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, can I make an additional comment? Mills, please. Uh, it is not the applicants uh, problem or issue, but I would like to point out the next Tuesday, I do believe we do have five new cases being presented to the board. So that'll be five cases that the board is going to have to read through, understand, and then make drives around town to make visits, you know, if he can, to actually look at the site so you can make a judgment on them. This is absolutely unprecedented. Usually it's one or two cases on a given night. I do believe we have 10 cases in all besides this in the month of September and five alone on Tuesday. The board is absolutely pillar to post. And there's a couple of guys on this that are really carrying a lot of water, Chairman Klein and Pat Hanlon. Um, and I, I really think they've gone beyond the edge here and asking for a little bit more time so we can get an organized draft. I really do not understand the document now. I don't even know the questions to ask because so many things are being added and taken out so rapidly. If I had a, a good document I could sit down and have a cup of coffee with, I could understand it. And I would know what I need to ask and what I need to research, but I don't know that now. And it's not your fault. I mean, you guys have been doing a great job at your end. I mean, you know, you're just trying to develop your property. It's your right to develop property. We realize that. But, uh, you know, we really do need some time to understand what we're dealing with and make sure we do a good job, both for you and the citizens of this town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. We can certainly set up, you know, a, a schedule where, you know, we're very clear about what will happen on what day um, so that, you know, we we don't end up, you know, period of time from now, again, asking for additional time. Um, we, have, we can certainly work that through um, and we can, you know, do what we need to do to alleviate your, your concerns and, you know, your, what, you know, the, the requirements from the, from the ownership. Um, but I, you know, 
the additional the additional time, certainly between now and Friday, the only thing we have time for is for a couple of emails, a couple of you know documents to come in, um, and then close out. If we go until next Tuesday, honestly, it's going to be over the weekend that we finally have the time to sit down, work through the draft, and get it out. Um, and so that's you know then it's really it's just time on Monday and Tuesday to look it over. Um, right, and, and, so, and if I can. Sorry. No, I go ahead. I was just going to say, my my question about the timing of that was to was to more like work towards a process. So if we do look beyond Tuesday, like what what is the date though that you know at the follow up that people aren't still feeling rushed if we know that they're going to be. So that's what I was getting at. Okay. Well, I mean. I'm assuming that that Paul, that you don't have a lot of time to try to work this through in the next week or so. That is correct. Okay. So, yeah, I I can certainly spend some time this weekend trying to consolidate this down. Um, I know there are probably some other members of the board who might be willing to pitch in a little, um, and so we could probably put something together by Monday. So that would be right the 11th, I believe. Monday the 11th, which is a holiday, but we should be able to get something out, um, which would be a draft that you know includes as much information as we have, as we can include, tries to clarify what things are, try to get rid of a lot of the editorial notes. So it's really a, a much clean, much much simpler to read and understand document, um, even if it includes a lot of provisions that uh, may or may not remain in a final, uh, a final voted draft. Um, if we could put that out on the 11th, um, I think then the question becomes, do we, you know, could we give until the 19th? to to close. Do you have a hearing on the 19th? We have nothing on the 19th now. <laughs> um, do you, well, I, I guess, first I'll ask uh, Art and Gwen if that date would work with them. Stephanie, what about, uh, I was trying to text you on that. If we did do the 19th, could we do it with no public comment so it's not a replay of tonight? And I think that's the deal, isn't it? Is that what we're talking about or are we talking about a replay of tonight? I mean, we could certainly, we could certainly try to limit limit the public comment to really being just about the draft itself. Um, but, you know, a lot, a lot of the comment tonight was that the public can't understand what the draft is and they haven't had time to look at it. So I think to, to give the, to, you know, clarify the draft, make it easy to understand, give people time to read it and then tell them they can't comment on it um, orally is a, a little problematic. Um, certainly, you know, it's a lot more informative, a lot more instructive to the process, but I think, I don't think we can go forward and tell people, you know, no, there's, you know, you can't, you can't comment further on the draft. Um, I think we can, as a board, we can certainly implore uh, the public and those who wish to comment on the application that, you know, we would, you know, part, part of the Part of the process here is that we are really just discussing the, f the draft decision and that comments, as some people did this evening, really need to relate specifically to the draft and not just be a rehash of, um, of comments that you know, we have received loud and clear um, in regards to um, you know, various site concerns around flooding and, and traffic and the like. 
um, you know, we, we know that we appreciate that those are big problems. And, you know, I personally think it's very important that the residents be allowed to have their say. Um, but I, I do agree that at this point in the process, um, we have we have heard those. We are well aware of those concerns, um, and they will. You know, we will do our best to note them um, as succinctly and appropriately as we can in the decision. Um, but that, as far as the continuation of the public discussion, it 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 is not. You know, reiterating that again is not necessarily going to. Uh, be more informative and more helpful to the process, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin, if I could make a, I, I, I could make a, a suggestion, and we could adopt a, just a time limit that we'll meet at seven thirty and we'll go till eight thirty. I mean, we don't necessarily have to let things go as long as they want. Um, we should encourage people not to do repetitive comments. I mean, the purpose of this is to gather information, not to not to gauge depth of sen sentiment. We know about that. And really what we're talking about is the, is just what's in what some people earlier called the details. Um, the board doesn't ha is going to have 40 days to comment uh, and we'll comment to each other a lot. This isn't a good time for us to be asking questions. And I'm, I'm willing to make an offer that I promise you that I will not say a single word and that will cut about an hour and a half off the, uh, off the, the, the meeting and, and that ought to make everything work out. All right, let's do it. Yeah, I, 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 I like what, you know, what you've been both, both of you have been saying. And I think, um, you know, we appreciate that, that having a good draft is really, really important and making sure that the details are there. We appreciate that also. We just feel like, a, a, you know, new testimony is very unlikely. We, there's, I, I, that's just, we've, we, I don't think we heard anything new about the project. And so I appreciate what you're saying about wrapping it up. Um, and I think, you know, we, 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 we need to give you the time so that you can do what you need to do. So um, uh, Pat, I like what you said though about uh, doing what you can to limit. I mean, you can limit the amount of time that somebody can speak. And of course you can, limit, uh, you know, it's an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, whatever it is. Uh, that would be, I would think helpful. And, and uh, Christian, I like what you said about <clears throat> focusing people just on, uh, on the issues in the, in the document. If indeed we're going to give a little more time to talk about the document, talk about the document and what's in it, and uh, be specific, that would be much appreciated. And uh, with that, I think we're okay with the 19th. Good. That works, Stephanie. That's fine. Mr. Chairman, not to throw a monkey wrench in things, but I have um, a hearing on the 19th. <laughs> Any chance we can do it the 20th? <laughs> That's that first. <laughs> I wasn't sure if we were going to get to this point or not, though. <laughs> Brian. I'm free any night that week. I'm free the 20th, so if we could do it then, that's better. I can do the, I can do the 20th. Let's okay. do the 20th, that's fine. You okay? Works for me. 20th. What time? 7.30. You know, I, you know, Pat, I think a thing you added there that uh, in order for us to keep our decision, let's just call it the decision uh, in a time frame as soon as possible, you hopefully could shorten that 40 day period to something smaller than that. That would be a uh, appreciated.
So we would be continuing the public hearing on October 20th at 7.30 p.m. for a limited time. And then extending the public hearing. Um, Paul, is it a good idea to also close the public hearing on the to schedule the end of the public hearing for the 20th, or should we set that for a different date? The beginning of December. Again, I, I like to have this is I, I would prefer to have it extended to the Monday afterwards, just in case there is some reason why the, the board hearing can't go forward on the 20th. If there's you know a power outage, if there's a hurricane, whatever it may be, you don't want to back into a constructive approval because the board was unable to meet and close the public hearing. So, and you need 48 hours to post your hearing. So doing it on Friday, you know, wouldn't work. We do have a hearing scheduled for the 20, Tuesday, the 26th. So if all heck broke loose, let me ask you: Is is the um, is the forty day period on the table at all to negotiate this? In other words, could you come to a decision in twenty days after closing the hearing? Mr. Chairman, depends a little when we close. Just you know, th I don't think that I I wouldn't be willing to agree to any shortening of that period at this point because we we just really don't know enough. Uh, about where it is, and and we need to give this as much consideration as as we can. Um, that said, we don't have to go forty days just because it's there. And most of us would probably like very much not to go forty days if we don't have to. It, as fun as it is to meet with you all, um, mm -hmm. it's not that much fun, and we have a lot of things to do. Secondly, you should recognize that a lot of the things we're now contemplating doing between now and the 19th would have to be done during the 40 day period if it wasn't done now as well. We'd still need a consolidated draft. The, the only thing that that is added is that is giving the residents a shot at it, which is adding a few days. Um, so to some extent, there's time that we would have spent in the 40 days that will get done before the 40 days begin. So that should take some pressure off. And I'm certainly willing to work hard to not taking all the time. I don't think anybody wants to take 40 days to decide this, but we don't want to take, we, but we're, I'm not willing to decide it. it I mean, this is with the most important case that the ZBA has had in years and maybe the most important case that the ZBA will have in a number of years. And I think that it's our obligation to do a reasonable job and to do the very best job we can to get this thing decided as best we can. And I don't think that we should accept artificial limitations on doing that. You're just gonna have to, you've seen how we work, you see what we do, we see, we've seen what we've done in other cases, you're just gonna have to trust us. So if we are continuing until the 20th, um, so Paul has recommended possibly extending the public hearing period until the 25th, um, which I would certainly put forward with the heavy caveat that our full and unbridled intention is to close it on the 20th. Um, And then from there, that would put us uh, 40 days would be the 29th of November, I believe. But November, but Thanksgiving Day is the 25th. So we could, I would imagine for the board, Tuesday the 23rd of November. Um, is, a, is a regular hearing date for us. I think we could certainly strive to be done by the 23rd of November with the deliberations. As a goal. As a goal. 
but that sort of is nice and clean. We can be done with it, sign it. Everyone can go off, have their respective meals, and Great. enjoy their family. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to nitpick this, but uh, you know we couldn't do the 19th. So instead of going to the 18th, we went to the 20th. Is there any reason? Yeah, you couldn't do the 19th. No, I know you couldn't do the 19th, but that's good enough. Let, not available on the 18th either. No, no. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Maybe that's wait. All right. Uh, all right. All right. Mr. Chairman, if we could, I, I would suggest yeah. that if we go with the 20th, we just keep the hearing to close at that date on the 20th. And I think that if a if a catastrophe does arise, um, the applicant's not going to be unreasonable to say on the on the 20th, you know, if all electricity gets shut down, um, mm -hmm. that we won't grant an extension then. But I think it, at this point, I, I think. Um, you know, it, maybe it meets a, a solid compromise, you know, of the applicant's desire to have a firm date for this to end um, and the board's, you know, um, desire and, and, and everybody's desire to make certain that we're looking at a good draft. So. Yeah. How about we say Thursday the 21st? Just in case, just in case we can't make those calls on the 20th. Thursday the 21st. Yeah. Let's go with it. <laughs> okay. Then oh man. We would be voting to extend the public hearing period for Thorndike Place until Thursday, October 21st, 2021. And we would be continuing the hearing to Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So with that, may I have a motion to extend the public hearing period for Thorndike Place to Thursday, October 21st, 2021? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. All those in favor, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Was that an aye? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Aye. The chair votes aye. That is approved. And then a motion to continue the hearing for Thorndike Place to Wednesday, October 20th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. They have a motion. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Mr. Mills? Again, vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Revelak? I think. Aye. There oh, we go. Aye. Yes. And Chair votes aye. So we are continued. Um, and then if the, the thank you all on that, we are continued on third eye place. Uh, just for the board, um, knowing now that our intention is to be fully closed the public hearing on the 20th, we're gonna need to set up a schedule for discussion. Um, we do have a hearing scheduled for the 26th, which currently only has two items on it. So I think I would add um, to that date the start, if, it's, uh, if it works for Mr. Haverty, the a start of discussion on the, um, 
on the decision on the 26th and that we can set our future our schedule going forward at that date. That works for everybody. Mr. Haverty, is that a good date for you? I have two other hearings that night. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I'm free the 25th or the 27th. All right. Um, well, the 28th actually. Tuesday's the only day I'm booked up. Okay. Um, I am all, also free the following Tuesday if you want to keep it on Tuesdays. What would people rather do? Would you rather double up that week and have a meeting on both the 26th and the 28th, or would you want to have one on November 2nd instead? Are we, are we voting in Massachusetts? On November 2nd? I don't think so. In some still, jurisdictions yeah, we no, are, but I don't think Arlington is. Okay, okay. So we can still meet on the second. So then we're, under, we're not allowed to meet if it's election day for some obscure reason. Um, but the- Mr. Chair? Yes. I vote that we put the pedal to the metal and go for the 28th. Let's get this in gear. That work for people? I would prefer that. We do 28th at 7.30? Yeah. Off the Band-Aid and get it done. All right, the first deliberation meeting is going to be October 28th at 7.30. All right. And then I don't have my fancy slide for upcoming meetings, but um, we have a regular hearing schedule for October 12th. We now have a continuation scheduled for the 20th. We are closing the comment period on the 21st. We have a regular hearings on the 26th, and we now have deliberation starting on the 28th. All right. Thank you all for your participation. It's a nice meeting at the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout this. So oh, going on four and a half hour meeting. Um, I especially wish to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linema, and everyone else uh, for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And it's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And then to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I will second. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't All quite right, get there quickly the board, enough. Mr. DuPont. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Emphatically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. Good night. Thank you guys. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone.